All right, we are live. Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. This is September the 1st, wow, 2019. Mm-hmm. We're entering September. Uh, our guest today is Trevor Henderson. He uh, is an artist. He creates what he calls found footage art and, and other horror art. Uh, thanks mm-hmm. for coming on the show, Trevor. Of course. Thanks for having me. Sure. Uh, okay, so we'll do introductions, and then we'll talk to Trevor, and what did you say just before we went live, um, Pete, because I thought it was great. Oh, I was I was thinking that, um, I, I don't know if I, I, one of my favorite movies is, is Horror Express. Yeah, I love it. And uh, in many ways, it can be viewed as a prequel, or if, if not another adaption of um, Who Goes There. It has this. It, it tries to build the same paranoia in the same sort of snow and isolated setting. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, in Siberia, rather than the South Pole. Right. The same sort of uh, body snatching element to it, too. Exactly, and you don't yeah. know who. who. Yeah. It, it deals with mind transfer rather than uh, body assimilation. Uh, body assimilation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But there's also this sort of psychedelic scene where you get to learn how the creature got there millions of years ago. Um, and then awesome. has been waiting, waiting for a long, long time. I have to watch that again. I've only seen it a handful of times, like many years ago, but I remember it being very good. Yeah, and, and who's in that again? Christopher <laughs> Lee and Peter Cushing. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, how can you beat that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It yeah, he, well as, uh, uh, he got lunch money for doing in that movie. He's just doing <laughs> that movie very briefly, like five minutes. Yeah, yeah, he belongs he, there. He, yeah, five minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he belongs there. Yeah. Now you could have an actor be. In, I mean, like Christopher Lee was in the original Dracula for only seven minutes. Christopher Lee was in. The, but but it was a major character, so you didn't really notice that. Yeah. 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 Um. Good, we had some reverb there, but I think it's gone. Uh, so, found footage art, Trevor. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, we didn't do introductions. Uh, Pete. Oh, yeah. Hurricane Pete, uh, please. Speak. Hurricane Pete, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ask me where I am in a couple days. <laughs> I'll let you know. This thing is bearing down on us right now. So, by 2 o'clock this morning, we should have uh, tropical storm force winds. Oof. Stay inside, so, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Pete's in West Palm Beach, and I think he is a writer. Are you a writer? I, I can't. Remember. I write. I I pretend to write. I write the worst <laughs> novels you've ever read. Uh, no, actually, that's not true because I have read some terrible. Yeah, I know you can't. That can't be factual. You write short. Yeah. You write short story collections that masquerade as novels. Yes, I am. Ooh. I am. I am a high practitioner of the fix-up. Which was used to be very, very common in the '60s and '70s, and now not so much. You know, uh, Trevor's interested in Lovecraft and cosmic horror. Uh, tell him about your trilogy, just real quick, and then we'll move on. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the trilogy, which is actually now a quadrilogy with a fifth book on the way. Right, like Hitchhiker's uh, Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, it starts with uh, Reanimators, which is a. a, a more detailed telling of what Herbert West was trying to do in 20 years of, of fighting uh, or fighting death, yeah. but told from the point of view of someone who really hates him. <laughs> um, nice. That was followed by The Weird Company, which is sort of my version of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but cool. it's all Lovecraftian monsters. Nice. Going Soul. to save the world. Um, it ties into the thing. In the it ties into the thing. It does. It bridges nice. the gap between um, at the Mountains of Madness and uh, Who Goes There. Oh, that's so good. It's right in there. I, I've i always thought that those two stories, that, that the Who Goes There was a sequel to oh, okay. At the Mountains of Madness, um, mostly because in At the Mountains of Madness, there's a mention of a second magnetic pole. Yeah. And the in Who Goes There, the expedition is actually the sec- second polar ex- second magnetic polar expedition. Ah, I see. So I think there's a, a, a tie in there. It's a correlation for sure. 
And then the third book, which is directly in the series of Reanimatrix, which is about Alan Halsey's daughter who, you know, dies. Yes. But it's Arkham. So is she dead? <laughs> and and then, you know, the Peasley Papers, which I published with Mike, all ties into this. But that covers um, from like the Paleozoic to the heat death of the universe. Nice. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's the really check cool that thing out. about that book. Yeah, just go to well, Pete can't decide. I think if he if he's, if he's Pete Relic on Amazon or Peter Peter Relic on Amazon. So try them both. So cool. <laughs> hey, Pete. <laughs> Yay. All right, uh, Heather. Um, Heather Landry. I draw stuff that's creepy, kooky, and altogether ooky or something like that. <laughs> you can look at my <laughs> ooky stuff on sandpaperdaisy.com. All right, Rick. Rick Lay, I write articles on uh, pulp era authors and uh, occasionally building fiction. Yes, by the way, uh, Rick just, just did a Patreon podcast for us, for those of you who are Patreons, or I'm sure will be as soon as I stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's $5 a month. Just Google Lovecraft using Patreon. But Rick was talking... Uh, for almost two hours, I believe, about Hammer Horror Films. And that's just part one. Nice. It was really great to listen to. So, you know, uh, if you want to support the show and Lovecraft Easy and get some great content, um, there it is. I'd, I'd be really interested in that because I've only seen, like, maybe three to four of the most popular I, Hammer. I'm well, really... Oh my a lot of blind spots. A lot of blind spots in Hammer, unfortunately. I've seen like a uh, Taste the Blood of Dracula. I've seen the the, P, uh, the Peter Cushing Frankenstein with Christopher Lee as the monster. And like maybe one or two more. Yeah. Well, we don't... You're in for a treat, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't uh, call Rick Mr. Encyclopedia for nothing. He, yep. it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was great. I oh. highly recommend The Reptile. Oh, yeah, I've heard that before. I've heard people talk about the reptile as a real stand Like alligator people. That's not a Hammer Horror film. And But don't forget Plague of the Zombies. Plague of the Zombies was the other one I was going to bring up, yep. Uh, all right, Matt. Hi, I'm Matt Carpenter. The prize this week, Mongrels by Stephen Graham Jones. It's a hard it's cover of the first edition. I'll be happy to sign it for you if you want. No, seriously. <laughs> um, this is a great story about werewolves. Yes, it is. And there's a fun read. So if you send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com and put mongrels in the subject heading, in a little over a week, I'm going to draw a winner and then I mail you the book. So easingprizes right. at gmail, not AOL. I just want to make certain of that once more it's not nearly cool enough for that okay <laughs> um hey trevor can you tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into your art yeah um i'm an illustrator who works and lives in toronto ontario canada um i graduated from the ontario college of art and design and i have just been drawn horror art since then um the found footage art has been a fairly new thing maybe like the last year a little bit over that um, but it's uh, really fun to do, and uh, I just like uh, drawing ghosts a lot. <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the things that really drew me to your art was um, it's the creepy and the supernatural in these normal or mundane settings. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's like what my favorite kind of horror um, is suburban horror, um, domestic horror, that kind of thing, where it, it is in a very familiar place. Yeah, yeah, like the one I used to uh, today to get people's attention to the um, podcast. You got this kind of tall, weird-looking creature monster with the long jaw, right? The draping jaw. Yeah, and um, it looks like you might be looking out of a car, if I have mm -hmm. that right. And yeah. then, then he's just beyond this normal wooden fence. Yeah. I mean, imagine driving up and seeing that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the. I think one of the reasons why it's kind of resonated with people is that um, it's something, I mean, everyone's taking spooky photos when they're in like the woods at night and whatnot. And you always imagine seeing something. Right. Um, 
So I'm just trying to visualize what they would see, I guess. Yeah, and it being in the normal setting, I think somehow just it just makes it more scary. Yeah. So, in totally. my view, anyway. Uh, Rick, uh, you said that um, Trevor's art reminded you of a story that I have told several times on this show, um, and I thought I'd tell it to Trevor on air. Uh, this is probably the sixth time I've told it on the show, so right now everybody's going to be looking at their phones because they're bored. <laughs> but anyway, uh, my wife and I, this is like, I don't know, 18, 19 years ago, we were yeah. coming back from, I think it was a wedding in a town that was about two hours away. I just I just can't remember. Yeah. Uh, I'm too old. <laughs> um, and it was, it, was, it was basically, it was a two-lane, it wasn't a highway, it was a two-lane, you know, uh, interstate. It wasn't an interstate, it was a two-lane highway. In the dark, there's woods on each side. You know, you can imagine it's a pretty creepy setting. Yeah. You're fine as long as your car doesn't break down, in other words. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so um, we're going along at 55, 60, whatever, and we see this shadow run from the left, out of the woods from the left, mm. across this, the highway in front of us, and then to the right really quickly. And what it looked like was for all the world like a uh, two-dimensional upright shadow mm -hmm. so it's no good yeah no and I asked my wife to, what she saw and she described the same thing oh man yeah so, I've heard lots, lots of stories of similar stuff and it's always really scary <laughs> <laughs> well uh, you know it's not it's not that I know what it was because I don't but mm -hmm. you know it was unusual um uh, Heather, let's start with you have some questions for uh, Trevor, I believe. All right, well, as we see from his awesome wall behind him, he's clearly a fan yeah. of wonderful horror manga. <laughs> yeah, which oh, I yeah, yeah. totally knew about you back from same hat days. So Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. But, oh yeah, right. I remember that. Yeah, oh, remember that yeah. place? Yeah. Way back. That was that used to be one place where you could get Ito uh, scanlation and stuff before they were published here. You could get trans on them or whatever. Yeah, well, yeah. You guys might have been luckier in Canada. I don't know, but no, we we're not. <laughs> but um, are you excited about so Uzumaki being adapted in cartoon form on yes. Toonami? I'm ex I'm extremely excited. Um, it was it was really nice that uh, the other night when the trailer hit, like my phone kind of blew up because people knew I was going to be excited about or tagging me in in the news. But I think it looks beautiful. Um, I'm not familiar uh, with the other work by the director, but I, I'm told it's something very similar in terms of tone and atmosphere. Uh, I think it's an anime called Musashi, Musashi, something like that. Um, and I'm a huge fan of Colin Stetson, who's doing the music uh, since he did all the work in Hereditary. Um, and they're doing it all in black and white, which I think is really important. Um, you're just going to see like the textures and the line work really, really nicely. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm rambling about how much I'm going to enjoy it just from that small little minute, minute long teaser, which I've watched like 20 times now. Um, I wish it was longer. I'm just saying it's four episodes. I don't know if that's a half hour episode or a 10 minute episode, but, um, they've, they've earned the benefit of the doubt for sure. Um, and were you telling us earlier that you met Junji Ito at TCAF? I did. I met Junji Ito at TCAF in May, um, and it, I may or may not have cried or come close to crying. <laughs> I would have. Uh, yeah, and I got to uh, hit a translator there. I got to speak to him very briefly and just say how much he meant to me and how formative he was and is as an artist to me. Um, and he signed uh, like the very first manga I ever bought, which was Uzumaki Volume 1, back in grade nine i think at high, in high school um which i now have like sealed in in plastic above my above this computer right now on my uh, manga shelf dude that's uh, weird that was the first one i ever got too i i got to go to the forbidden planet um uh, bookstore like in london and nice. i just it stuck out to me and i didn't even know anything about manga <laughs> and i yeah. was like well this looks cool and then that's I mean, as well, I think I grabbed it off yeah. the shelf and like opened it and saw like the guy twisted up into a big right. spiral on the barrel. And I was just like, I guess I'm buying that. And I guess this is my thing now forever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I'm excited for this. He's kind of had like a renaissance over the last couple of years with more and more people discovering him. Um, and 
at the very least, it it can't be worse than that uh, anime that just happened with his work, which I thought was just dreadful. Yeah, I think a lot of people felt that way. Yeah, just like really bad cheap animation that did a disservice to to his framing and his his um his line work and his textures. Anything else, Heather? No, I think Matt has some he wants to add. Yeah. Okay, now you have to bear with me here because I'm not an artist. Yeah. But I was kind of wondering first, like, um, you seem very young. Where did, did you train and then uh, did you mentor with someone? How did you get uh, trained up to do this uh, sort of work? Yeah, um, well, I've been drawing monsters since... I was a kid. My dad encouraged it from the youngest age he could. Um, he's a huge horror fan to this day. He's the one who showed me very inappropriate horror movies way too young. Um, That's a great dad. <laughs> he's a great dad. He, he'd come home from working late and like, he'd wake me up and we'd watch like Return of the Living Dead and Army of Darkness and, and just late, late at night on a school night. Um, so I've just been into it um, in every possible way since I was a kid. You know, books, uh, movies, everything. Um, and then I went to um, the Ontario College of Art Design in mm -hmm. Toronto, and uh, that was where I got my bachelor's. That was, I think, six to eight years ago now. And I've just kind of had a one-track mind since. I've just drawn different iterations of monsters and ghosts since then, and uh, just are, tried are you different a approaches. Artist? What's that story? Are you a full-time artist now? Oh, no, I wish. Um, I work at a bookstore on Queen Street in Toronto um, full time. And then I just kind of like come home and then draw until I fall asleep. But then how did you get started on this um, drawing on photos? Because it seems to me to be I don't lots of people draw monsters, uh, but yeah. I haven't seen much of this kind of art before. And hmm. uh, maybe you could tell us uh, about your techniques, about how you do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think last June, or yeah, around last June, I just got it in my head that um, I really liked, I've always really liked found footage horror movies. And I think that they're an underappreciated medium uh, for telling very specific kind of stories and having specific kind of scares. Oh, sorry. Okay, now you got to tell us which two or three are your favorites. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I have them on hand. It's um, number, number one of all time. It's a movie I watch every single Halloween night. Uh, it is one of the top two scariest movies I've ever seen is a, a BBC Halloween special called Ghost Watch. Um, oh, I've seen that. Seen yeah. Uh, but I've, is, I've seen that. That's great. It's terrifying. Um, it's basically a Halloween special that was like um, kind of like a, you know, the, the War of the Worlds broadcast where it, they made it seem like it was really happening. They used real life reporters yeah. and celebrities. And um, at the time when it aired live, they had kind of said at the beginning, like, oh, this is fake. But because a program ran long, it cut that off and they just went right to the broadcast. So everyone kind of thought it was actually happening. And it's basically this, these reporters uh, who were really popular at the time investigating a haunted house in this very suburban area. And it does this really masterful job of just ramping up um, the scariness and what's happening until by the end, it's like fully surreal, but you're so drawn in by that point. Um, and it's just deeply scary. It's really well done. Um, I always recommend it. Uh, so that would be my number one. Number two is this movie called uh, Noroi the Curse, um, which is a more recent horror movie um, involving the disappearance of an occult, occult investigator. And then three months later, this um, VHS tape arrives at the doorstep of the... The, his employer's company basically and the whole movie is just this VHS tape um, so basically because it's um, an, a professionally edited tape they can make use of it's not just like a, a found footage horror movie which will have the one camcorder for the whole movie it's like clips from game shows clips from documentaries all telling this really vast uh, weird fiction style story very Lovecraftian um, yeah. involving um it's just kind of this vast story. It's like a very long horror movie, but it's really, really good and super scary. Um, what and what I, was the title again, Trevor? Oh, it's no called uh, Noroi the Curse. N-O-R-O-I the Curse. Um, and you can watch both of those movies on um, this uh, service called Shudder. That's just horror movies. 
Yeah. Um, you can sign up for a free trial, watch it online. They're both there. They'd make an incredible double bill. It's insanely cheap, at least here. It's like $2.49 a month. Yeah, it's very cheap, and they have the best horror movies. It's like yeah. invaluable. Yeah. yeah. So those would be my two, probably. If I had to do a, th a third, it would probably be um, the zombie movie Wreck uh, from Spain, uh, which is just great. Really good. <laughs> um, I yeah. love Wreck. Wreck, and it's <laughs> so good. It was remade in the United States. Um, Outbreak, right? What's that? Or not Outbreak? It was um, Quarantine. 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 Yeah. And Wreck, I find superior. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it. I just, I, I like Quarantine, and I, I own Quarantine, but Wreck is so much better. Yeah. In, in. It, <sighs> ending they've changed the ending as to i was what gonna say yes yeah exactly i i won't spoil it but they took out the most unique aspect of wreck and yeah. made it kind of just another zombie movie whereas with wreck you can jump right into wreck 2 which starts 20 seconds after the first one ends and they really expand on the the themes that are only brought about by the ending of the first film and it's both of them are amazing together especially back to back yeah you know, a lot of people read horror, watch horror movies, but relatively speaking, anyway, there's there are less people who are into cosmic horror and Lovecraftian horror. How how did you get into that? How well, what drew you to that, Trevor? I read Lovecraft in high school. I think yeah. that might be most people's. Uh, yeah, that's intro. true. <laughs> uh, I read Lovecraft in high school. Read through all that, and then um, in university, I started reading. Um, uh, Oh God, uh, Mr. James, and which is less cosmic, but um, like Algernon Blackwood, uh, who I love, um, and a few of his other like contemporaries that I, I kind of think I like a little bit better than Lovecraft. I know it's uh, might be blasphemous, but um, no, you know, actually, when I first got into Lovecraft, I, I did like Lovecraft, but I I bought far more of what uh, of the um, of Lovecraftian fiction. You yeah, know. yeah, for sure. So, so Willows um, by Blackwood is like an all timer for me. Oh yeah, and Arthur Mockin, uh he's the other one that I guilty yeah. like more than Lovecraft, the Great God Pan and the White People. Oh. But I just Willows, literally yeah. listened to the Willows for the first time yesterday in my life and I was like That's one of the that's one of the most unsettling stories ever, the Willows. It's so yeah. scary. It's so scary. The Wendigo is great as well, but the Willows is deeply just troubling. Yeah. More so. Yeah. Um yeah. Uh, okay. So you, you you like these found footage movies? Yeah. And then when did you start drawing on pictures? And is there some special technique? Oh yeah. Sorry. Um, so what happened was I just basically said I want to see if I can recreate the kind of the money shot from a from a found footage horror movie. You know, where there's always the quick glimpse of a monster or something. Um, yeah, like you know, Slender Man or whatever out behind yeah, the tree. Yeah. Exactly. And I wanted to see if I could just like take that moment and make my own version of it. Um, without having to have it be associated with any kind of a found footage movie or anything that already existed. So I did one, the very first one was just, it wasn't photos at all, it was just uh, uh, painted digitally and it was a bunch of trees with the, with like um, 10 to 15 different hands coming around the edges of every tree. And it's done in a black, like a, all in neon greens, like a night a nightlight um, and with a, like a camcorder interface over it. And then I just wrote a little flavor text underneath just, you know, the, the maximum characters for Twitter just saying like, oh, this camcorder was found at the top of a tree and then in, in Japan and nobody knows what happened. It's very <laughs> spooky. Um, That's and then I, for a long time, for like months, I did a bunch that were just drawn and uh, the response was really, really nice. And then I just decided like, oh, can I take it like a step further with the realism if I um, use a photo and then just try my best to integrate um, the new elements like the ghosts or whatever using lighting and tone and transparency and, and film grain that kind of thing uh just see how close i could match it as almost an experiment and uh the response was just really great so i kept going with it when you do it on the photo and again i'm not an artist so maybe this is a dumb question are, are, no. is it all digital or are you drawing with a colored pencil paint whatever no no yeah it's all digital with this um crappy little wacom tablet i have um <laughs> 
Next I gotta tell you, man, it is yeah. brilliant how you make sure not to have like too many hard edges or too many sharp highlights or whatever, so that it looks Thanks. real. I've yeah. always really admired how well you captured the. Thank you so much. Fuzziness of the the actual camera shot instead of a perfect, beautiful drawing that somebody put on there. Like you're smart enough to incorporate it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's really yeah. important. Um, yeah, I use uh, a couple of really special uh, specific brushes. One, um, they're part of a pack called the Kyle Webster brush set that I think a lot of people use. Um, oh, cool. Okay. I use one called Soft Fuzzy Brush for like drawing the main thing, and so it's really indistinct. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, just a few other ones to like clean it up. And then there's a bunch of filters that go on top. And stuff. You, you know, Heather, what you just said and, and what you just said, Trevor, uh, again, not an artist, but the, the fuzziness of it seems to me, the unknown is what's the scariest. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. if it was some monster that was really brought into clear focus and everything you'd be like oh that's a nice monster and if you'll good notice work. it's like obscured a lot a lot yeah. of it's in shadow that's also brilliant it's a great idea instead of showing too much of it absolutely yeah, really well done it's amazing. yeah the, the last um the last step whenever i do a drawing is going over it with like covering up 70 percent of it with a with a shadow yeah, brush gotta. i mean yeah yeah uh, you know just as an aside um I noticed you had a, a Patreon, but I didn't notice, I, I didn't have time to look at it. I'm yeah. wondering if you do, or if you've ever considered, like, say, someone sending you a picture and saying, can you do something with this? Like, maybe, uh, yeah. you know, their backyard, or, uh, you know, whatever, any mundane type of, yeah. you know. I've never done it through my Patreon, but um, I kind of have, like, uh, people can just send me photos on social media. And I have a big gigantic folder where I throw them in, and there's no guarantee I'll use that photo, but it's in it's always in the running. Um, but I have Twitter, done commission. Right? Yeah, Twitter is the where I usually get most of them. Um, and then I have done some commissions for for specific photos. Well, if, if, if you if you put on a Patreon level that there is a guarantee that you'll get to it, yeah, then maybe you can quit the bookstore job sometime. Although working for a good bookstore does sound cool. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really fun. I get a really good discount on books. I get to tell them which horror uh, books to bring in. Um, and I don't have to think about it too much. So it works out. <laughs> yeah. uh, Pete, Heather, Matt, any more questions? For I yeah, actually, um, yeah. so I, I sort of encountered this kind of thing locally. And it, I guess it's a global phenomenon where people take old um thrift store paintings yeah yeah and paint monsters into them yeah, and then those. a couple of years ago i started following um simon stonhog i love him i love his stuff and and cool. everything he does yeah so for everybody else who doesn't know is that simon stonhog sort of works in this is he 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 paints kind of these really mundane pictures mm -hmm. with monsters not monsters aliens or tech Robots or, or impossible technology and yeah. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. And, and so in many ways, what you're doing they here reminds me of what he's done with those paintings. Oh, where yeah. he, he's taken a little kid who's walking through the woods and there's a giant robot following him. Yeah. Um, you've done pretty much the same thing. You've taken something very mundane, very yeah. normal, and you've added one image and completely changed that yeah. picture. And yeah, it's, for sure. It, it, you've, it's very unsettling. Where his is kind Thank of you. inspirational, yeah. yours is very unsettling. And that's really hard to do. Thank you. And, and I think you've really done a great job. Thank you so much. Um, you know, this is, uh, like I said, this sort of, there's a sort of a, like, the technology exists now to do this and people yeah. were playing with thrift store uh art oh yeah, yeah. some of this what you're doing is going the next step hey i can get this in your backyard oh yeah yeah i can take <laughs> the scene everybody has you know and and that's kind of neat and yeah. you know a couple of your images remind me of this recurring dream i've had where i check into a room at a hotel Mm -hmm. And I open up my curtains in the middle of the night, and there's a guy standing there outside my window looking in. I've done, I've drawn a couple that are exactly that, yeah. Right? 
And then I, it's like, okay, I close the curtains and I go back to sleep and I wake up the next morning and I go downstairs. Yeah. And I have breakfast. And it's over breakfast that I realize he was staring in my second story window. <laughs> it's not just a guy, yeah. you know, it's sort of, it's yeah. that little thing, you know, I expect I, people. Pete, yeah. I read a novel once that's got a similar concept. I wish I could remember the novel. But basically this guy, he he has to check into a hotel to, I don't know, investigate stuff in a town for a while or something like that. And, you know, he keeps hearing a tree scratch his window every night. You know, he's on the second floor. And, uh, you know, this app just goes on for weeks, you know. And then he checks out of the motel and then just out of curiosity walks around to see the tree and there's no tree there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, you know, um, there's a there's a Brian Lumley story calls uh, is called Billy's Wood or Billy's Tree. Oh, really? Billy's Oak. Billy's Oak, mm -hmm. where the uh, Titus Crow is talking to somebody and they're like, the guy's come. He's saying, "Oh, I can tell you a real ghost story," and they're just he's listening to the oak tree creak in the wind outside. Uh -huh. and it's like there's no such things as those ghosts. So no such things as ghosts. It's like Billy was hung from that oak. <laughs> By the way, I, I will talk about this later, but there's there's something similar to that in uh, Cosmology of Monsters by Sean Hamill, which okay. I will talk about later. It comes out on the 17th uh, of September. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah. you know, I'm 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 feeling your art, man. It's Thank you. To me. Yeah. I was yeah. gonna say that, like, um, if the response hadn't been as, I think that, like, what you're talking about, where where you can make it, you're it feels very like. I've walked through that park or I've been on that street, like very right. local to everyone. And if it didn't have that kind of like identification, I don't think it would have caught on. Like it kind of has a little bit. Um, no, and I the agree. fact that, uh, the fact that people, a lot of these are just people are sending in stuff and they get right. to see, you know, a ghost stuck in their bedroom or the hallway to where they work at, or, you know, on their walk home. Right. Um, so much horror is, is in that I see is, the, the the altar in the middle of the of the mountains with everything you know the, the all the old dolmens around and, and everything yeah. so it's sort of like an impossible scene for me to be in it's beautiful yeah. it works but it's an impossible scene to be in when you shift it to my backyard or something yeah. that looks like my backyard or a backyard i've been into yeah that becomes more personal yeah, you remove that uh, wall saying, like, oh, I'll never be in this, like, castle, or I'll never right. be in this temple, so I'm not in danger. I don't have anything to worry about. Right, yeah. right. Uh, the same goes for writing a short story or a, a novel, horror short story or horror novel. Too many writers, they they show too much. Mm -hmm. You know, same concept. Yeah. So. It's important. It's uh, it can be difficult, like deciding what the, how much do you show, how little do you show, kind of thing. Pete, what you said also reminded me of, uh, and I think I think you know about this too, or remember this too, Trevor. Uh, scary stories to tell in the dark. Uh, uh, story. I, I love it. <laughs> My childhood. <laughs> so t yeah, tell us tell us about your your big fan of scary stories to tell in the dark, the books. Huge, 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 huge fan. Um, since I was in grade school, I've, and, and I've what great art, with, man! Right? Uh, yeah, the arts. Stephen Gamel's art is just uh, legendary. Um, I think also kind of heightened because he like um, eschews interviews, so it's kind of adds this air of mystery around it. Um, but he has to made it. Have, he's made a deal with a demon to do that. <laughs> that art. He's he's done something. The pale lady. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. The Pale Lady, uh, Harold the Scarecrow, which is one of the scarier actual stories with the drawing. Um, I, I love it. Hum humongous fan. I have a jacket that's a giant blown up back patch of the. Uh, it has the giant blown up back patch of the, uh, like oh, the woman's face, the haunted woman's face, which just leaves uh, like eyeless holes for eyes. Oh dang, dude! Did you like make it, or did you find it somewhere? <laughs> My partner, uh, my partner Jen Woodall, used to work at a print shop, and she—I mm -hmm. just sent her a, a, a Google image. She printed it out, and she also used to work in wardrobe, so she cut that wow. down. And she did. That's she did everything for me. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Uh, um, I feel bad because it legitimately scares children, and I don't want to scare children in public. But <laughs> I'm going to have to send so. us a picture of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for real. Hold, do, hold on a sec. You know, hold on. I'll run and get it. That's right. <laughs> no problem. 
I, on the other hand, have no qualms about scaring children in public. <laughs> you do it to your kids every day. I do it. You know, I believe that children should know what fear is. It's true. Once you Absolutely. have a couple kids, you're like, you know what? No. And then you just. You know what? There is, so, there is something in your closet. Oh, God damn it. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, hang on. Let me put you on the big screen. Keep, yeah. keep, oh, keep it there. It's beautiful. Trevor. Oh, my God. It's horrible. <laughs> nice. I feel so sorry for our our listeners later, but you can come back and watch the uh, uh, watch the uh, show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You guys got to watch the show on YouTube now. I'm sorry, but you have to see that. Shirt. Just gotta. But, but yeah. it's easier now because I can. It's right through my Spotify. <laughs> yes, it is easier. Uh, but uh, if if you want to see anything that we've shown, just I'm talking to the audience now. Just. Google Lovecraft Easy and YouTube should bring you right to it, so the, nice. and you can look at the latest show. So, so he, that was incredible, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. Did you guys see the uh, the film that just came out? Christine I did, film? and I was going to ask you what you thought of it, and I want to know what everybody else thought of it. That that, that who's seen it? I loved it. Uh, I thought it towed the perfect line between, um, uh, you know, a uh, gateway kid, a uh, gateway kids film. For horror fans and also having enough uh to satisfy people who are a little bit older and grew up in the books um and a lot of the times you can really feel them butting their head against that pg-13 rating and it gets they're like just one step shy away from being really graphic and weird yeah especially when great. uh well i don't want to spoil anything yeah not all everybody the, makes it let's put it that way <laughs> all of the demises in the film are are surreal and really horrifying in a way that they wouldn't have been if they could have just had blood in the film, honestly. Yeah, yeah agreed. that's true. Yeah. What about the rest of you guys? Have you seen it? Yes. You what, what did What did you think, Heather? Loved it. Kind of irritated my friends whenever they asked me what the differences were, and I just started reciting like the entire three books. <laughs> but don't ask if you don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, like they're literally on my bedside table, and I just read them constantly. The original three, you know. So I'm mean, great. Yeah. But yeah, I thought it was great, and yeah, like Trevor said, I mean, it's it's sweet and innocent in that it would have been appropriate for older children to see, for sure, you know. But the imagery is just fantastic and stunning, and they really incorporated visually some of the very most iconic uh, images of Gamel's, and like it, they even managed to uh, do Mitai Doji Walker in a way that mm -hmm. made sense, which I was amazed. I was yeah. like, there's no way they could do this. People are just going to start laughing because it's a terrifying story. But you would laugh if you heard a dog going, Linchy, Kinchy, Kali, Molly, <laughs> Dingo, Dingo. But they managed it. They do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, highly recommend. Very good. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, before we go on, Pete, you were talking about how you love to scare kids when. Trevor went to get that. I do. I love scaring kids. I think kids. I think. Be I think this is something we should explore briefly. It's important. It's important. Yes. yes. I, I. You know. I think kids should know what. You know that fear is an appropriate response to things that happen. Mm -hmm. and they should not be ashamed of being afraid. And you know there are reasons to be afraid. There's yeah. a reason why we're afraid of the dark. Yeah. yeah. It, it, oh. it, it, why it's built into us. You know, we sh there's there's a there are reasons that we are cautious. There, were, you know, we, when we are put in situations, there are reasons we get nervous. And and what we don't want to do is give in to those fears all the time. But we also need to know how to properly respond. And Matt's yeah. going to chastise me. No, no, it, it, Pete. My next door neighbor is very nice. He's what I don't know, fucking thirty years younger than me. He's got three young kids. <laughs> Isn't everyone? <laughs> okay, so I was talking to him and said, oh, what are your kids going to be for Halloween? And he says, oh, we're not going to do Halloween. Boo. And I yeah. put an inflatable with the glowing pumpkin head, and I put it right on the property line. <laughs> yeah, do you guys have any plans to terrify the children in your neighborhood? I certainly do. Oh, oh yeah. Do I, I got mm -hmm. lots of spooky music and spooky lights, and the kids love it. I live yeah. on a, a main intersection, so we don't ever get any um, kids coming by on Halloween. And last year, like one single kid came by and asked for candy, and we didn't have anything. I got so excited, I ran out and bought like tons of big full candy bars, like 30, 30, 40 bucks worth. And then we didn't get any other kids 
and I've never had any of the kids besides that one. So, <laughs> so what did you give him? A can of soup? No, I just heard I didn't have anything, and then I thought, oh, he's the first of a wave of, of kids actually trick or treating and wearing costumes. I want to th- encourage this, and then we were just stuck with all this candy that I had to eat. So, yeah, <laughs> you know what you get when you get that, right? What's that? Diabetes. Oh, that is what happens. Yeah. Gotta, okay. Gotta watch that. So, all right. So, uh, something I'm kind of interested in mm-hmm. because I think it's we all know it's hard for an author to make a living. Yeah. Even harder, I think, for a visual artist. Yeah. Unless you get some kind of patron or something. So I was wondering if you've had any plans for like a commercial foray uh, with this new skill. Uh, yeah. <coughs> I mean, I'm. Kickstarter. What's that, sorry? <coughs> we were talking about perhaps a Kickstarter? Yeah. Um, I have been trying well not really trying i've wanted to organize uh, a kickstarter of all the existing found footage art i've done or at least a good majority of it um for quite some time but i don't want to do it without um including the people who have sent in photographs that i painted on because i feel like that would be kind of uh, slimy and disingenuous and i don't want to make that kind of money off of people even if it's just like a flippant like oh this is a photo i had it's still the photo they took and i want to include them in some way so it's less a matter of like setting up a Kickstarter, which would be a lot easier if it was all my photos. Um, but what I'd have to do is hunt down every single person through the like 200, 300 photos that or at least the ones I want to use and, um, you know, find them in proposition like, oh, this is what I'll be doing with it. I would just, oh, you'll be included with this amount, you know, um, I just haven't had the time to do it yet. Uh, yeah, but I, I, but I, I want to do it. see that. And yeah. the other option is probably even less appealing going out and taking two or 300 pictures yourself. Yeah, I'd have to, like, start... I have, like, a handful, like, 10 to 15 that are my own photos, especially in the beginning when I was starting out. Uh, but for the most part, they're all from other people who I credit, like, online and everything. It's all that anybody's ever wanted, but I, would want, I wouldn't want to make money off of them, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, there's been a lot of uh, successful artists and podcasters and so forth who've who've made a decent living on on patreon or at least yeah. made some good good change i i For know sure. that i wouldn't be able to do what i do without my patreon so absolutely that, that um, might be a way to go as well i have a patreon um and it's very low level it's lit- i think it's a, uh, just a dollar and then if you want you can put two dollars in and that's it and it's just kind of ongoing support so it's kind of underutilized right now in terms of I'm not doing anything really exclusive with it. It's just kind of like the art that I'm constantly like flooding out on social media for free. If you want to throw me a dollar, that that's great. Thank you. That's yeah, a friend of mine. I do mine too. Yeah, <laughs> a friend of mine, Soren Narnia. He runs the Knife Point Horror. He, Knife oh Point man, Horror podcast. Are it's you like, familiar with that? It's like top three best horror podcasts out there. Fantastic. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. He's a friend. I've had him on the show a couple of times, and I looked at his Patreon one time, and it's just people throwing money at him because, hey, Soren, don't stop, please, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, he's great. Um, I, I, I think, <laughs> I honestly think um, you, you could come up, you're probably one of the best choices to come up with some art that could accompany <laughs> some of the podcasts oh, he's you. done you know and for, so and for anybody listening uh my favorite podcasts on knife, knife point horror are the ones that soren himself reads i'm not saying the other ones are bad or anything but you know he usually starts off with my name is whatever and then goes into this really weird story that happened so mm-hmm. He's yeah. great. I like um, Knife Point Horror is probably my number one, and I think it might be tied with um, the Magnus Archives. If you can listen to that one, it's I so good. yeah, huge Magnus fan. Huge, I yeah. don't think I have. What's that? What's that about? Um, it's kind of it's they're very episodic um, for the most part, though it does get very um, kind of like in universe as it goes on. But it's about a, a society in London that called the Magnus Archives that logs all these spooky paranormal incidents people come in and record them and it's about the new archivist coming in after the previous one has died mysteriously and kind of going through the archives and listening to these different stories um and like you know threads start to appear between characters and different um recountings 
uh, but they're just really well done, really well done, uh, scary stories. Yeah, like I'm, I'm literally doing a Magnus Inktober this year. Oh, that's such a good idea. I've seeding the Magnus Wiki with my drawings because I'm that guy. But I wanna, I'd love to see your drawing of Jane Prentice. Well, you'll get to. All right. So. <laughs> nice. Uh, cu a couple of things before I forget them, because I yeah. will. Pete, just yes. ge just getting back to your um, scaring children thing. Do you remember the very first episode of? You made me think of the very first episode of Supernatural, when Dean comes in. He's ar he arguing with him. He wants to take him to find the dad. And he goes, uh, "You know, when I told Dad there was something scary in my closet, he gave me a forty-five. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, and he's like, "Well, what should he have done?" Dean's like, "Well, what should he have done?" He should have. He said he should have told me not to be afraid of the dark. He goes, "Of course, you should be afraid of the dark." <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Well, yeah. It, so, um, you know, when I do this, and we do it all. I don't. I've done it on Halloween a lot. We set up like safeguards so that kids don't run into the street and everything. You know, and we, you know, parents know we have signs up and say, "Look, this is this is." Kid scary, but kid appropriate. Mm -hmm. I'm not chopping anybody's arm off, but you know, because you know the teenagers, yeah, nobody. They're just, they're just, they're not. <laughs> they're just there to neck. Yeah, they're too cool. The little kids, you guys scare the little kids, and I, you know, the funny thing is, that I think that there's, there's this age that kids aren't scared yet. Mm -hmm. Like three or four when. They're like, okay, you look different, but there's nothing to be afraid of. My parents are right there. They would not be sending me up here. Yeah. <laughs> and then after that, somewhere along the lines, they learn that mom and dad can't protect them from everything. And then yeah. they start getting scared. So. Uh, okay, on a, this is a very serious note. We're on, we're on the live show. This, this is a live show although many of you listen to it recorded later. And there's there's live text chat on the side. Well, my wife, Danielle, is at school working, watching the show, and she's talking shit about me. Says, I saw scary, scary stories to tell in the dark without them. That's how excited he was to see it, so don't let his nonchalant attitude fool you. So <laughs> <laughs> Then I don't know if I'm allowed. I, I won't say it. I'm not, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about the gunny gunny sack man that lived in her house um, Jeez. when she was a kid. Yeah, it's a funny <laughs> slash scary story. Oh, that she says scary. she says I can. All right, gunny sack man. So <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, Trevor. I told you we were informal. I'll get back to you in a minute. <laughs> no worries. So I want to know about this gunny sack man. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> when she was little and like. Uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, her mom, you know, babysit other kids, and so they would need to go. She would put them down for nap time, and you know, didn't want they needed to stay in bed. So she told them about the gunny sack man who lived in the attic. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Danielle. And she would make these noises when they when they would like get out of the bed. She would make these noises. And so, uh, like Danielle says, if her mom did this sort of stuff today, she might be <laughs> pulled off. Did, did she ever dress up? I don't remember if she ever dressed up. She dressed up. She dressed up for other things. She was very good at scaring the kids. Nice. So yeah, that, that's the gunny sack man. <laughs> I I don't remember if she dressed up, but the oh here she goes. Yes, he lived in the attic. If we were out of bed, he would come and put us in a sack and carry us away <laughs> so that's uh, how our mom kept him in bed so and it probably but, worked gr uh, but, but great name for a monster right gunny oh. sack man yeah that's great so uh heather did you say you have more questions or did you ask them actually everybody else managed to ask him because i was just gonna ask the you know i think trevor you have like a really awesome store in me with some of your prints and stuff in it yeah. But I was just going to ask if there's anywhere else to get your stuff or if there's a stray copy of Puff Sugar somewhere that you can sell to me. You know what? Or anything like I that. probably have 
a box of those lying around somewhere because I made way too many and they didn't sell at all. Let me. Are you um, kidding? Oh God, no! There, it was a huge flop. Uh, that was like but, one of the regrets of my life because I was a brand new mom and I had like utterly no money and I couldn't get one and I've like oh, regretted it my entire life. What, what I'll send you one for free. Sorry, what are we talking about? Oh, sorry. Way back, way back, I did a um, I I kind of crowdfunded my first experience with Kickstarter. I crowdfunded a, a Lovecraft art scene called a uh, Puffed Shoggoths. And it was uh, had a ton of great it art in it. It contained awesome art, you guys. The art was really good. Um, the art, the the cover not so much, but the art inside was was great. Uh, but yeah, I'll I'll just just send me your um information. I'll send you one. Well, geez, dude, thanks. Dang. Yeah, let, let me let me dig around and make sure I have one. But I think I have a box in my closet uh, somewhere. What we need then is an Etsy shop to sell the rest. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, Matt, Matt is trying to get you money, man. So, <laughs> no. I mean, a Lovecraft themed art scene, dude. Yeah. Uh, if, you have, yeah. if you have those, let me know. I'll, I'll send you cash. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I'm, I'm, I have one, Pete. You can send me cash. Uh, yeah. yeah, Pete, Pete is in the I won't send you anything sure. in return, but, you know. Yeah. Let, I'll, me, um, let me rephrase that. If I still exist in five days. <laughs> I will send you, you know, PayPal money. You nice. will only ascend if you go up into the storm. You would never, you know, yeah. you'll just ascend into a really cool, tentacled, awesome dude. It's true. Pete sent me a text this morning saying he was self-medicating to stay calm from the hurricane. Oh, no. so, yeah. I mean, understandable, but. Um, right. Let's see here. Um, I wanted to ask you about. Uh, your you've got two books out in PDF format. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my first kind of book, or my first book that was kind of playing around with doing um, uh, horror comics, was called Bad Things Coming, and it's all pencil art. And it's one of those books where, like, I can look at two to three pages and be like, "That's pretty good," but overall, it's kind of old and and not my favorite thing. But I still like stand by a little bit of the art. Well, and I, then I, I have, love, love, love the title of the second book. So, <laughs> thank you. The second book is my like straight up Stephen Gamel scary stories ripoff called uh, "Odd Noises in Empty Rooms." Um, That's such a great title. Thank you. Uh, and it's just uh, these really harsh um, white on black or black on white, really simple drawings of ghosts with um, really like really short little paragraph stories um, accompanying most of them. And uh, it was kind of like the early version of what I'm doing with the photos. Before that, I was doing these kind of stark, almost charcoal-looking black on white and white on black uh, drawings of, of specters and ghosts and monsters. So just a little collection of those, yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm really interested in getting uh, odd noises in empty rooms. And just yeah. so the audience knows, it, of course, there's two of them, but the way you're talking about the second one really appeals to me. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, it's the, where do we it's the better book. Uh, I've got a URL for you. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Trevor. Uh, Gum Road, just like it sounds. G U M as in Mike. Road. Yeah. Gumroad. dot com slash Trevor Henderson. That would be right. I'm just double checking myself here. Yeah. So, yeah, that's it. They're both on there. Uh, Bad things coming is a buck, and uh, odd noises in empty rooms is five bucks. Um, but I am gonna be making another physical copy like a risograph printed version of odd noises and empty rooms oh whoa whoa, whoa. i'll wait for that wait. yeah it's um hopefully for the small press expo which i'll be attending in september 14th and 15th but i will set aside like 20 to 30 to put online uh, um yeah but if yeah. you're in that area if you're going to be near um sbx i will be tabling Nope, I'm I'm stuck in Texas for this foreseeable future. But uh, I would I would fair. love to buy one of those from you. Yeah, break yeah. a leg, man. Yeah, so. yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'll set a, I'll set a pile aside. I'll let you guys know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Channel Zero. I, yes. I like. Yeah. Hey, tell Tell me about your love of Channel Zero, and tell me your favorite season, and I want to see if it's the same as mine. Yeah. Um. Channel I, Zero. I, well, let, let me start. I, I have not seen all of them yet. I won't spoil anything. Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. What, se what seasons have you seen? I've seen the first one, and I've seen uh, The Dream Door. Okay. Okay, cool. You've seen one of my two favorites. Um, Channel Zero is one of the is probably the best horror show of the last 20 years, at least 30 years. 
uh, and it was completely unwatched because it never hit Netflix. It was just on sci-fi. Um, and it never found the audience, in my opinion, that I think it deserved. Um, if you guys, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the show, but it was, mm-hmm. uh, it was a series where every season was a different creepy pasta from the internet that the showrunner and new writers and artists, uh, kind of bought the rights to and did their own thing with, um, and then kind of stretched out to a full season. Um, the showrunner, Nick Antosca described it as like the bad dream you would have after reading the creepy pasta that, that day, that's what the show would be. Um, so the first season is uh, about a, a children's show that um, may or may not exist and has uh, kind of negative influences on a, a group of children in a small town called um, Candle Cove. The second season is one of the best meditations on grief I've ever seen in horror ever called um, No End House um, about a haunted house uh, where every room um, is supposed to be scarier than the last uh, up to room four, which looks like you're not in the house anymore. It looks like you're home again, but you're still in the house. Um, involves peril dim- dimensions, doppelgangers, and all kinds of freaky stuff. Oh, I, I love doppelgangers. I'll have to make sure yeah. to watch that. Season two, by the way, is my absolute favorite. I think it's perfect. Okay. Um, it's got uh, John Carroll Lynch in a lead role. I don't know if you know that actor. He was in Zodiac and a bunch of other stuff. He's really, really good. It Do, doesn't uh, ring a bell, but... Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you probably know him when you, if you saw him. He's like a big character actor. Uh, the third season is this really, like, Grand Guignol, uh, uh, European kind of influenced, Dario Argento influenced season. Um, that Oh, a little bit of Clive Barker in there, too, um, about this certain block in a city where people go missing, and it, may, it has to do with these mysterious stairs that lead to nowhere, and it uh, involves a uh, kind of a immortal family of cannibals that look down on everyone else as like inferior and feed off the homeless and uh, yeah I watched about half of that and I just I love Rutger Hauer and I think that's his last yeah um, one of them for sure yeah uh, but uh, I just couldn't get into that one Uh, it's my least favorite yeah Yeah. and Dream Door is um, kind of like a Cronenbergian love triangle where it's about a woman who uh, moves back to her family home and discovers that she well they discover a door in the basement that wasn't there before and when she opens it uh something gets out and it's her imaginary friend from when she was a kid and it's uh now obsessed with killing everyone who wrongs her and uh it kind of dovetails into this cr- very Cronenbergian the brood style thing where um about people who can make little doors appear out of nowhere with their minds that make whatever they think about come out and do whatever they want and it becomes like this war of these childhood imaginary friends um what appealed to me about the dream door was it was you you have these two people just moved moved into the house just got married if i remember correctly yeah and then think about how freaked you'd be if you walk suddenly walk down in the basement and there's a door there that's never been been there before yeah and you know you can't open it uh when it revealed what was going on is is when I I kind of I watched the rest of it but I I didn't like it as much as the first couple of episodes. It turns into a very different kind of thing eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it is definitely worth watching. Uh, yeah. And I'll take your word at um, season two. You said I'll two, watch, yeah. I'll watch that. Yeah. If nothing else, like they all have their merits. Um, they're all very different. They bring in different directors and writers for every single one. Um, and also the cool thing is that they bring in a different um, artist specifically to do kind of their craft for each season. Um, a season two involves these really bizarre sculptures from a from an outside artist. Um, season uh, one involves um, this really scary performance artist who like tears off their own face and stuff. Uh, so it's kind of cool that they reach out to people in the artistic community for their show. But um, season two is the best one, in my opinion. Uh, I think it's flawless. Uh, but they're all great. Well, I've just met you, but based on your art and you know reading your tweets and so forth, it, it does not surprise me that you like Channel Zero. Yeah. So <laughs> huge, huge fan of that show. I, I think it was a. I think it was a crime that we didn't get at least a couple more seasons out of it. Well, that was t- the, the tooth, the the tooth. Yeah, that was season one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know why, but we what we lost Rick. He may not be feeling well. Uh, anyway, um, guys, including uh, Trevor, everybody, 
Channel Zero, I have been wondering if anyone can give me some similar shows, you know, like creepypasta type stuff, or, you know, creepypasta in a way is kind of weird fiction. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Uh, any ideas, thoughts, movies, TV shows? Well, I kind of think the Twilight Zone is similar, the original series. That, oh, yeah. that, that's very true, yes. But much more brief vignettes. There's yeah. a lot of stuff that um, um, the show has taken inspiration from, like movies like It Follows. Um, yeah, I love that one. Me too. Uh, but as another in form of another show like it, I don't really think so. The only ongoing horror show I can think of is like American Horror Story, and it's not. Yeah, not I, I'm not a big fan, you know, personally. <laughs> me either. Yeah, I can think yeah. of like another podcast, but unfortunately, I can't think of. Yeah, a show. And, and books, of course, but yeah. It's the it's a very literary weird fiction uh, show, um, and I don't think a lot of people latched onto that. I don't think it found its audience so much, but it really does feel like uh, fiction. It feels like weird fiction more than anything else. Exactly, weird fiction, and you know, it, you're in a way you're uh, you're creating your art is weird fiction, and then you've got podcasts like uh, Soren Narnia's Knife Point horror yeah. that's a podcast of weird fiction and then you got channel zero which is a weird fiction tv show and, and i just yeah. hope that more th this happens more and more there i think a, dream door was pretty a lot of people took notice of that one what pete sorry there there was something that i watched on netflix last year i think the episodes were only five to ten minutes long it was animated it was from south america I know the one you're talking about. I haven't watched it. It's the one set at a radio station, right? Yes. I forget what that's called. Um, it, it was. I watched it. It was really well done. Wow, that sounds that interesting. Up. Set at a radio station. Yeah, it. It's not always set at the radio station. The radio station is broadcasting little little snippets that that fit into the story that's going on. It's called um the Curlian frequency. Yes, yeah. that's it. The curly really frequency. Good. Really enjoyed that, and ultimately it ends up being Lovecraftian. Oh, okay. Okay, I got to remember the curly and frequency. It's sort of set in the town where you can get there, but you can't leave. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a Night Vale esque a little bit. Yes. You, know, you can check out anytime you like. <laughs> but yeah, you can yeah. never leave. <laughs> yeah. I just saw a movie that um, kind of stuck in my head as being a little bit like Channel Zero. Um, in the sort of like a weird fictiony teens horror kind of thing uh, called um, Headcount. Uh, it's an independent horror film that just came out, I think, this year. But it's also based really not on off any existing creepy pasta, but it uses creepy pasta as a uh, kind of the uh, thing that unleashes the monster. And it's about these group of teens, you know, in the desert uh, at a party house kind of thing. Um, and they read this creepy pasta off the internet, and it summons this thing. It's this really interesting monster uh, that shape changes and infiltrates the group um, and is obsessed with groups of five and separating them into groups of five to enact this bizarre ritual kind of thing. But in effect, what you get is a lot of scenes where, you know, the camera will pan past a kitchen where one character is standing there and then that same character will be in the living room. But they don't comment on it or acknowledge it. And you have to just—you're constantly scouring the background for like, was the guy I just saw the monster, or is that guy who's in the background the same? Is he the real guy? And that was the monster. And they play with that in a lot of really inventive ways. Um, it's really cool. You know, this isn't quite the same, but I remember in the first season of Tw Twin Peaks, you know, way back in what was it, '91, Pete? Yeah. Uh, there is an episode, like, th I don't know, three or four episodes in, where th the two high school jackasses owe this other jackass some money, and they go out in the woods, mm -hmm. and they're talking to him and everything, and he's <clears throat> he's uh, not happy with them. But the point is, they're out in the woods, and then they see this figure emerge behind a tree, and then it's gone. And uh, one of the boys asked the guy, who was that? And he goes, don't worry about it. And it's never revealed the whole time of That's Twin right. Peaks who that was. And I, I, and I love that. that, you know. 
<laughs> well, if you love that, then you're going to love Black Spot because I'm two seasons in and I still don't know what's going that's, on. That's the wrong way. I I quit after about four episodes into season two. Because, I've never even heard of that one. Yeah, it's, Black Spot. It's, it's on. a Belgian thing? French. No, it's French. Right. Yeah, French Belgian. Uh, yeah, I think validated. it's on Netflix. Yeah. Uh, at least in America. Um, yeah, it's in Netflix, yeah. Uh, someone <laughs> asked on the live chat, what's the podcast similar to Ch Channel Zero? That's called Knife Point Horror. Yeah. And again, uh, personally, my favorite episodes are the ones that are read by Soren Narnia. Not to say that the other ones aren't good, but uh, but um, anyway. Um, you, you talked about your favorite horror films, didn't you? Did we miss any of those? Favorite found footage with this lot of crossover with just general horror, but yeah. Yeah. What about books? Oh man. Favorite horror books, or what are uh, you re or what are you re reading recently that you really like? However, you want to answer this question. I can go over some recent favorites. Right now, I'm reading um, "Growing Things" and other stories by Paul Tremblay. Oh yeah, Paul. Excellent, uh, excellent, excellent book right now. Uh, really good. Uh, before that, I read um, "The Elementals" by Malcolm McDowell which uh, just blew my mind in terms classic of being gothic. a classic gothic uh, ghost story. Um, I think that one is due for a huge discovery. Um, before that, I read uh, The Fisherman by John Langan and also uh, The White Carnivorous Sky, same, same author, John Langan. And that was, those were both incredible. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a pile I'm kind of rotating through a little bit, reading a little bit at a time. So the, here's the funny, um, I was in the process of outlining and I had finished outlining a novel about horror and fishing that I was going mm -hmm. to send to Ross Lockhart. Yeah. And 10 minutes before I sent it to him, he sent me the PDF of John Langan's The Fisherman, uh, the damn. blurb. Damn. He's like, Pete, would you blurb this? And I'm like, <laughs> son of a... <laughs> <laughs> That happens. That's unfortunate. Uh, I'm like, well, I'm just happy that I didn't go any further with it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be bad. That'd be bad. Yeah. Well, you're reading a lot of our, our friends' novels, so that's great. John is such a great guy. Paul is. Uh, have you read any of Laird Barron's stuff? Huge fan. Yeah. Yeah, I love I love Laird Barron's stuff. Um, I was reading uh, Swift to Chase, and... I didn't finish that one yet because I just jump around a lot, especially with short story collections. But it's he's across the board always incredible. I just recommended um, someone on Twitter was actually talking about um, how they thought it was super scary when monsters uh, have a behavior where they mimic like the voices of people who are in you know wounded people or like people like friends right. like yeah. draw people out of prey like the whole um, Logan something that's maybe like not sentient using this complex language for that and i recommended a, a story we called um in a canyon in a cave by Laird baron that, that employs that same sort of thing uh it's one of the like scarier short stories i've ever read did you read uh oh, sure. did you read paul's uh disappearance at devil's rock no that's the one one out i've read a uh, uh head full of ghosts and uh, cabin at the end of the world yeah and i'm reading this one i haven't read that one yet yeah well if, if you're interested sometime when you have a free minute or free couple of hours, I should say. Uh, about two months ago, I had uh, Laird and John and Paul are really good friends. Yeah. Uh, and I had just them on the show, and they talked to each other about the evolution of their friendship and writing and everything. And yeah. It's a it's, it's, it was a really enjoyable show. But uh, Laird made a joke at the beginning, like, uh, "No, no horror. I've never written horror. Just crime. <laughs> Only crime." Because yeah. he's a uh, I don't remember if he's two in or three in to his, his, his crime novels, which are very good. You, if anyone listening, you should pick them up. I think he's on a second one now, maybe? I, th I, I, I think that's right. Um, yeah. Pete, what the hell did you text to me? What, what is, is that the gunny sack man? That's me. That's you? Yep. Wow. <laughs> I, I posted it on my Facebook page. Uh, if Matt wants to steal it, he can put it up on... <laughs> On the easing. Uh, Can I just cover something real quick, guys? Because I just yes. thought of something. 
Yes. Are you familiar yeah. with SCP Foundation, dude? I am. I'm, um, I'm a big fan of that. Because that made me think of with many voices whenever you were talking about how scary it is whenever a non-sentient crooner can mimic. Yeah. And if you haven't seen that one, that's a lovely one. I don't know if I read that specific one, but I, I go on there frequently and, and kind of click around randomly. Um, I have some favorites, obviously, uh, but it's it's a huge resource, actually. It's great. There's also some really great weird art that they make for the entries, too, like the mm -hmm. weird art that they make for Humans Refuted. I don't know if you've yeah. seen that one. That's great. No, I'm um, going to check that out, too. My Face That I May Be. You'd probably Jeez. really love that art. Okay. And then, I'll write this down. Yeah, okay, so Humans <laughs> Refuted. Humans Refuted, yeah. My face that I may be. Face that I may be. And SCP-106, The Old Man. They I have love a really good yeah. creepy picture of what happened to one of the victims that you might really dig if you haven't seen Yeah, I've seen that one. They had to take down the original creepy picture for him because it was copyright. But the, the replacement is not as creepy, but quite creepy. Oh, I'm glad I at least got to see it before they did that. Yeah. I'm I'm playing a game right now called Control for the PS4 and it's mm -hmm. very it's like an SCP Foundation game. Like oh, they cool. if you, if you're interested in SCP at all, it's it's a it's a very good game and it's very unofficial, but it's definitely like that's exactly what they're doing with SCPs and the whole thing and yeah, it, it's really good. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So yeah, Rick's back with us. Hey Rick. Glad Hello. to see you. My computer crashed. No problem. Uh, uh, I was going to ask you, do you have any questions for Trevor? And then I looked up and you weren't there. So <laughs> anything or? Did you go into what other movies besides found footage horror movies you like? Other movies besides? Um, yeah. Uh, it Follows is a huge one for me. I was kind of obsessed with that movie for like months. Um, top of my head, though. Um, Kind of all the classics. I love Creep Show. I'm looking at my shelf here. <laughs> <Trying to remember. laughs> no, it's kind of funny how every generation has a different entry drug in the horror movies. Uh, oh yeah, I was. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say mine was Universal horror movies. That that was what Kill Pulver and I got into. Oh, nice. Um, mine was my dad, you know, waking me up at one a.m. to watch um, '80s '80s horror movies, '80s splatter movies, that kind of thing. Um, and then I kind of got like an appreciation of like seventies horror and sixties horror. Yeah, um, I, I say again, and, and I'm not being sarcastic at all. Sounds like mm -hmm. you have you, you've got a great dad. That, that's I do. Just such a cool <laughs> thing to do. Yeah, no. It's a, <laughs> you're I, lucky. Uh, you're lucky in that it takes a, a short while now for movies to go to television. Oh yeah, yeah. When, I, when I was a kid, you had to wait like about ten years or so. It was like, <laughs> It was like we were watching all the old universal horror movies from the 30s and 40s. Yeah. And the Hammers ones that were coming out in the 50s and 60s really didn't start to hit till this, hit television until the 70s. Oh, yeah. I mean, I grew up on a, a few of the universal monsters. Creature from the Black Lagoon was a big one. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein was also huge for me yeah. when I was really young. Uh, but Creature is always my favorite universal monster. Well, let me tell you about my dad. This is just one example. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, he's he's not a nice guy. Never was a nice guy. Uh, so he had rented the time machine, you know, the original one, the 1960, of course. Cause this was like 1983 or something. Yeah. Uh, I was 12 or 13. And, and Pete, as Pete and everybody here knows, I love time travel. Uh, got several books, shelves of uh, time travel books. Anyway, so I thought, oh, my God. <clears throat> This is going to be awesome, but we didn't have time to watch it that night. Mm. Next day was a school day, uh, use the term loosely. <laughs> and so what I did was I set my alarm and I got up really early and watched the time machine. And I loved it. My dad comes down there as rolling credits and, you know, gets all mad at me for getting up early. I don't know why, but mm. no, sort of the opposite. So... <laughs> <laughs> You you uh you have a wonderful dad for what what I remember from what my father did was they had movies back then yeah thanks um, he's young in around the cave and tell stories <laughs> there was uh it was Halloween I was four or five and he took me and my two older brothers to a 
film thing at the local cinema, and they showed Dracula, The Wolfman, and Frankenstein as a triple feature. Nice. And so that is, that, like Rick says, what's your gateway? That was, that was mine. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Matt, really you got quiet. me beat. My dad didn't read me H.P. Lovecraft until I was 10. So. <laughs> he would read me that for uh, my bedtime stories. My first Lovecraft story was The Rats in the Walls. He read me that before bed. Nice. Boy, you and Pete Rollick. <laughs> You're muted, Rollick. Wait, this is my story. She ripped off your, your dad story. Did you that too? Did so four and five. Oh, my dad we have the most really awesome dads. <laughs> Rats in the Wall is a bedtime story. Yeah. You know, from the the modern library edition of the Supernatural. This big fat. All right, book. All right. I I got to bring up this book again because the the narrator is the youngest of three kids, and he's got two older sisters. Well, the middle sister. When he's like thir when she's like thirteen or fourteen, and he's like six, she reads him to bed every night. Kind of takes care of him because the mom is coked out. out. What something like that? I don't want to get into it, but she's not there. Uh, let's put it that way. And she's reading him Lovecraft the entire time. So, all right, cool. It's a good book. Well, I just want to tell you, Pete, before I met you. I read my son a horror story. It was not The Rats in the Walls, but it was The Graveyard Rats by Henry Cabot. Okay. Mm, that's yes. a good one. Which, Which is sort of a, his version of The Rats in the Walls. Yes. yes. And I just want to tell you, Pete, that before I met you, I was not as nearly as corrupted as I am now. Well, that's right. I am the corrupter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we talked about... Uh, you know what? I think my last question is... What about the the books and other paraphernalia behind you? Oh, you got yeah. a great you got a great background there. It's kind of a uh, an assortment of stuff in there. There's like an EC Vault of Horror collection of all the uh, the reprints. Um, there's a lot of board games actually, so that's deceptive. It might look like lots of books. Um, got uh, some sci-fi. I've got the Southern Reach trilogy, which I'm I've only finished Annihilation. I've got to review it too. Um, some Joe Hill, uh, Nosferatu. to um, I have Hex, which I just finished not too long ago. Um, by Thomas Old Hubolt, I think his name is. I met him. Yeah. Yeah, he came. That's cool. To, yeah, nice guy. Cool, cool. Never, I never heard of him before, but you know, he showed up at a con and it was like. You gotta read my book, and I'm like, okay. What? Really? I know he has a new one just coming out. Um, yeah, I liked it enough. I thought it was cool. Well, is um, that Outpost Thirty One board game, or is that the Thing art book by Print and Blood? I see the whole thing. That is the Thing board game um, with my hand painted miniatures inside. Uh, I have the art book uh, somewhere else because I did do a drawing for that at some point. <laughs> you were in that art book dude i have one shoot yeah, yeah, yeah. i missed that it's not a it's not an amazing drawing honestly i wish i'd had more time or i didn't procrastinate so much is what i mean but did you submit to the del toro art book or the other ones i did submit to the del toro one but just those two. Oh, i hope we get to be in that one together yeah yeah oh that'd be awesome yeah um some old vhs tapes on there too actually <laughs> Uh, well, Trevor told me uh, a few days ago that he'd like to stick around and chat with us after we're done sure. with our interview of him. Uh, I don't have any more questions right now. Do, do you guys have any other questions for Trevor before we move on? I'll take that as a no. Uh, Pete, I remembered, yeah. I remembered the name of I was saying to Pete earlier today that Sean Cassidy comes up with great shows that last one season uh, mm. like Invasion and what was, the, what was the name of your favorite show Oz Matt <laughs> is that what they called it <laughs> a couple of about a year and a half ago Oz yeah Oz uh, and what I couldn't oh, remember oh, Pete, oh it was um an update of the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Except, was it uh, Tin Man? No, no, not Tin Man. No, no. it was. It was it good, was, except Matt. No, Matt was, said it wasn't good, and he's really it, totally it was, wrong. It was. <laughs> I haven't heard of that at all. A uh, good reason. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what I couldn't think of was American Gothic. P. 
repeat. Oh, I remember American Gothic. Someone's at the door. <laughs> what? It's not like the, that was an 80s show, right? 90s? Yeah. Show? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Maybe 90s. Maybe 90s. Yeah. Wasn't that was a corrupt sheriff? Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and I like Invasion, which is which came out in 2005 and lasted one season as well. My yeah. wife watched it and got real mad at the cliffhanger. Why didn't you tell me there was a cliffhanger? I'd never would have watched it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what did you did someone like post something about there's going to be another Invasion or? No, we. I was complaining last episode that you know the, the, you people make these seasons and they don't wrap up any storylines. And it's completely useless mm. to anybody in the future. Even if you're canceled, wrap up the story so you can. It's worth more money to sell it for syndication or Netflix or whatever. Absolutely, yeah, the last true. last season of Angel, they didn't get much lead time that they were getting canceled, and it no. did fill a little rush, but it was done very well. Right, they it wrapped did, it up. Uh, they did end in an arc. Yeah, yeah. No. And how many pass. times? How many times has Buffy almost cancer? Then they wrapped up every season. Yeah. So. Yeah. So who is going to see it? Chapter two this week. Comes I out actually, on Friday. Uh, I actually already saw it. What? Yeah. Um. I, uh, I need to kick you. Out. I got to look for the button to kick you off the show. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No. <laughs> I actually uh, got asked to go to um, L.A. to like. Uh, I guess talk about the film and go to the red carpet thing. So I saw it on the uh, last week, I guess. Yeah. Wow. It's good. Ah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, th thumb, thumbs up with thumbs down. Uh, thumbs up with some trepidation. Mm. Well, here's um, a. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say it has uh, a lot of great stuff. It's very true to the book. Um, but the first movie is like 25 to 30% of the book, which is obviously, you know, humongous. This is the remaining 75%. Just all squashed. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's all great, but there's not a lot of breathing room. So mm. go into it expecting that kind of, um, it's just kind of breakneck pace. Um, yeah. Well, here's an article at I, I Horror that I came across, uh, <laughs> and it's titled It Chapter 3? Question mark. Andy Muschietti, wow. I don't know who that is, has some thoughts on Pennywise returning. It's kind of an exactly. interesting article. Uh, although the story of it is set to come to an end this month with it, chapter two. Oh, he's the director, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, director says there's more than enough Pennywise mythology to explore in future films. If Kelly was here, he'd be way thumbs up on this. Uh, there's, though there's nothing currently on the table, he doesn't rule it out. Um, yeah. Plot definitely comes to a conclusion in the movie. Uh, I yeah. guess Trevor knows that. Yeah. <laughs> he elaborated, quote, There is a whole mythology to the book, though. Mythology is something that always has opportunities to explore. It has been on Earth for millions of years. He's been in contact with, human, contact with humans for hundreds of years, every 27 years. So you can imagine the amount of material. So mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting and done right. That would be great to explore that. I'm excited for that, and I'm also very excited for them to um, re-edit the two movies into one uh, long either movie or series that uh, is to the chronology of the book, like going back and forth between the kids and the adults, because I think that's going to be the best version of both movies eventually. They, they really are going to do that? I wasn't sure. Yep. Pretty sure they're going to do it. It's all. It hasn't been confirmed 100%, but they've been talking about it a lot. I've seen it, some articles. It would be like they did with The Godfather series. They put those together? They put part one and part two when they put the Robert De Niro scenes all in the beginning was extra footage. Ah, that makes sense. And I, I'm not wrong, but like Dreamcatcher is like a sequel to it. It, it They name drop Pennywise in it at the end. Uh, yeah. Huh. So I assume so. <laughs> it's, a, it's in the canon. Yeah. Do you guys have a favorite Pennywise? Like a uh, version? Tim Curry versus, yeah. Oh, I was going to go through all like the, the monsters he turns into, but uh, I think they both have their own merits. I think that um, Tim Curry is a better um, as the clown, you know, as like kind of like the, the evil clown. But I think that uh, Bill Skarsgård does a really good job portraying like something cosmic pretending to be a clown and not doing a great job of it. Um, probably, probably, the, uh, probably Bill Skarsgård, I think, overall, but they both have merits. My, my, my opinion is it's apples and oranges, really. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, there's there's also then consider that that Tim Curry was acting for television. Yes, yes, that's true. And and that script was written for television, so there was a lot that you could not do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that's true. So, yeah, I will I will tell you that uh, uh, Pennywise in the second movie is uh, a new level of brutal. Uh, it's it's they don't mess around with that. It's very very mean spirited and is, uh, vicious. Is Chapter two is scarier than chapter one. Yeah, it is. Okay, there, here's why I ask. Because yeah. my son and I <laughs> dragged my wife to it chapter one, okay, in the theater. Yeah. And we're sitting at the back, and she said the only reason that she did not run out screaming is because I was blocking her way. She was sitting between Logan and I. <laughs> did you want to uh. see her run out screaming? No, I he, want you know if if it chapter two is scarier than <laughs> it's like it chapter one. You, I I loved it, but I didn't really feel like any there anyone was really in danger. Like I don't think it kind of felt like. Well, no, they like, have to make it to it chapter two. <laughs> yeah, it chapter two. It feels terif- like feels really scary. It feels like you can kill anybody at any given moment. Um, yeah, I think she'll I think she'll run screaming. Um, I know that's not very nice of Logan and I, but it's sort of a joke in our family um okay can i mention um no, no, you you, you, i got mocked viciously for this but i will persevere and you There's will a so again series on amazon called carnival row i actually wrote it down to ask you about it yeah i okay. want to watch it i think it looks good well it's set in like uh the the fey are real but uh they're caught between two warring nations and it's kind of a steampunk london kind of thing yeah most of the ones who are still alive are refugees in this huge city and not very well liked or treated very well. Yeah. But there's something that's going on mysteriously. And at the end of the first episode, um, there's this monster, which to me has echoes of Lovecraft written all over it. Yeah. That's what I, the impression I got from, from um, the promotional materials, but I've only seen two episodes. I haven't seen, there's like eight that were all released. But it uh, it may have because there's a dark god rising, and I think it has followers. You know, so you know, not necessarily Cthulhu, but the monster looks squiddish. Okay, it looks well, like a lot like that. Yeah, I wasn't gonna watch this, but if that's the case, maybe I'll give it a try. Well, mm-hmm. you can give the first episode a try, and if you don't like it, I mean, it's, this is this. I noticed that this. Uh, miniseries has split people down the middle. Some people like it, some people don't. You know, so mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I was going to ask you about that anyway, Matt. Um, there's a okay. I'm at I Horror again. Check out the brutal trailer for Haunt from Scott Beck and Brian Woods. Uh, I did check out the trailer. It looks pretty good. It's Halloween night, and a group of friends enter an extreme haunt haunted house. I think. Looking to have a few laughs and hopefully a few mostly harmless scares. This particular haunted house follows through on its promise to feed on their darkest fears, however, and they soon find themselves in a fight for survival. Now, this could go way into B territory, but it, it looks good. And uh, it says Beck and Woods previously wrote and directed 2015's Nightlight. I don't know what that is. And also co-wrote the initial story and draft for A Quiet Place. Oh. Eli Roth is the producer. Yeah, Eli Roth does splatter torture porn. Yeah, I'm yeah. not... Yeah, right? That kind of stuff? Yeah. When I, yeah. When I saw the uh, preview for it, I was kind of hoping it was like a supernatural thing, but if it's Eli Roth, I'm worried it'll be like, you know, maniacs torturing people, which has its place, but I'm less interested. In okay, it. I've passed on the information, but I'm now less interested, too. Yeah. yeah. So, Mike, have you have you seen um, Russian Doll? No. Oh, Russian Doll's great. Russian Doll is really, really good. Russian it's like six Doll. or seven episodes. Um, TV hours. series? What's that? Yeah. Obviously. Um, it's on Netflix. Netflix? Russian Doll. Yeah. Okay. It's a... Uh, Oh yeah, you were saying you love time travel stuff. Love right? time travel. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So it's science fiction. It's sort of. It, they don't. We don't know why or how she's time traveling, but every time she leaves the party, she dies, and she wakes up 
she comes back at the in the bathroom at the party. So it's and Groundhog Day. It's, it's Groundhog like, Day. A little bit like Groundhog Day, yeah. It is. But, but there's a lot of uh, new stuff with it instead of just uh, kind of being a rehash of that movie. Well, no, yeah. no. If you guys say it's good, I'll I'll watch it. Mm-hmm. I mean, some some there are times when she she lives fifteen minutes, and then there's times she lives for a day and a half. Hmm. But every time she dies, she ends up back at the party. All right, I'll check it That's out. Good. And, uh, then it, 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 and it's building a nice mythology. I thought this, the first season ended nicely where you could say okay this is over but then they got a second season yep so they they left themselves an opening to start over again it's uh, uh natasha leone i like her a lot she's really good we'll definitely check it out and yeah. that's a nice segue into uh i wanted to briefly touch on terminator dark fate for a couple of reasons <laughs> number one i like the uh trailer yeah. although i wonder why the uh Terminator Arnold Schwarzenegger looks old. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> uh, but I get the interesting thing about this is that they're ignoring all the other sequels. This is a sequel to Terminator Two, and yeah. everything else there, it's no longer part of the canon. If everything. Seems, yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna say the same thing happened with the Halloween movies. Yeah. Yeah. No season of the witch just gone. No, well, like, uh, no, uh, four, five, and six, like, gone. Oh, okay. I think it's everything after the end of part one is gone. I think two, you're, three, you're four, at, five. You're right. Epi- yeah. uh, episode two, uh, uh, the second one is gone, too, right? You it's know, now that I think of it, this siblings. is getting more and more popular because Halloween just did the same thing. That yeah, she's, yeah. She's, yeah. Not his, she's not his sister. Yeah. You know, and ignored some of the, the other movies. Yep. Huh. That, uh, that's interesting, and... Yeah, it's a nice way to say we're not stuck. You know, those movies were crap. We admit it. Let's do something different. You know, it, I think yeah, the Halloween was a whole okay flow chart. You know, the first <laughs> to, 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 just to say, you wonder how far back this goes. They did this. It was a popular French series in the 1850s called Rokin Bowl, and yes. one book bombed. So the so the author said, "All right, that book didn't happen. <laughs> I'm writing a totally new sequel." That's an approach. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why not? Uh, if you got fans, though, do it. Yeah. I think the Terminator franchise has fans. So, <laughs> uh, you guys see the latest Joker trailer? Hmm. Yeah. I, I also read a, a review that sort of was a, bit, a masterpiece. IGN, really? Really, really a lot of good good stuff. Yeah. IGN, which does it's it's a gaming uh, review channel for the most part. Yeah. First time I've ever seen it give a movie a 10. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I am kind of... Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Pete. Go ahead. No, I'm kind of torn by the fact that... What was it? 89? 1989? Yeah. We turned Jack Nicholson into the Joker by dropping him into a, a, a vat of chemicals. Mm-hmm. And now, 30 years later, all we have to do is expose him to the, her society. <laughs> yeah. I read, I mean, I watched a really interesting um, video, seven or eight minutes long today on YouTube. Um, I didn't even know I was going to talk about this, so I'm not prepared with the title or anything. But he analyzed that that scene that where the Joker in The Dark Knight goes and talks to the criminal underworld. You remember that? Yeah. Uh, and he basically... <sighs> there's a lot to get out of there but what, my favorite thing that i got out of it was that he pointed out that the joker he basically just in that 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 version of the joker just wants people to see what they really are you know everything's a joke to him uh it's it's pretty interesting i can't do it justice so i probably shouldn't have brought it up but look for that cool. um it's really good and and i wonder how um what's the actor's name i'm sorry uh, jo- Jocelyn Phoenix, Jocelyn Phoenix, Joaquin yeah, Phoenix. Yeah. He, Joaquin he, Phoenix, yeah, Joaquin Phoenix, yeah. He's a wonderful, wonderful actor, and I and I just wonder. So is Heath Ledger? How's this going to compare, or is it going to be you know once again apples, apples and oranges? oranges? And you can apples and oranges. I, I get the impression that it's sort of a Martin Scorsese version of the Joker. 
Yeah. It's yeah. like the king, king of comedy, taxi driver, but with yeah. the Joker. Yeah. Right. That's what I. And Robert De Niro is appropriately in the movie then. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Um. <laughs> All right, so uh, I've got a I got a few movies in my watch list on Amazon. I wonder if you guys have seen any of them. Yeah. The the, the new Jacob's Ladder. It's got three stars mm. on Amazon. Anyone see it? I don't know if I can watch that just because I love the original so much. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. Um, I, it's it's funny. It's getting th- uh, halfway decent reviews though. I thought it would just be like horrible, but if it's getting three stars. I well, I don't know that three is that great on Amazon. No. You know, four, four at least. I I don't tend to watch a movie it's, if it's got three stars. Fair. Um, unless you know a friend has really recommended it or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the other thing to consider is that you know Jacob's Ladder, even when it was out, was sort of like an art film, right? Yeah. It never. It, it's I really like the movie, and I you know Mike likes the movie and everything. But it's never been a really popular film. Mm-hmm. So, and certainly you rarely see it on television for good reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's it's kind of hard for you know, the a new generation to say, oh look, this one doesn't compare at all to the old one. Yeah. Well, you know, part of the three stars oh. could be people comparing it to the old one. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, we'll see. There's a movie called Assimilate that I found that looks good. Hmm. I haven't heard of that one. Jeez, Pete, you watch everything. You're you're failing me today. You're failing. I'm gonna look it up here. All right, yeah. Uh, I am stuck in season two of Buffy. Well, that's a good place to be. You know, we have two episodes left to watch uh, before we lose power. And then uh, we'll be we'll be taking a break until Christmas to get to season three. Is this? But, this, but the mayor, the mayor. Yeah. He's the is best. This, Sorry, Rick. Go on. Is, is this just introduce your family to it? Is this, uh, my my younger daughter. Yeah. She fell in love with the. I showed her the episode, the the um, the musical episode, and now she, she and she had questions. So, like, I got to answer <laughs> all your questions. I'm just going to show you the series. <laughs> you know? So we've got a two-year commitment to watch all of Buffy. Um, but part of been, and, you, you have to, uh, you know, Are you going to cross over into Angel? Because some episodes do tie in. Yes, and that is a question that I have to deal with when it happens. Well, when because, season four of Buffy happens, you watch... The first episode of Buffy, then the first episode of Angel, and so on and so forth. Uh, I've solved your little problem. No. When Angel uh, turned evil, um, my daughter really freaked out. (laughs) And uh, you took it very personally. Um, By the way, I'm being told that my internet connection is unstable. I just saw, yeah. I think it means you're unstable. Well, no, I, I think we're getting a ban come through. So Yeah, if we lose you. Uh, if, yeah, if you lose me, I'm not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another movie called Assimilate. The trailer is, is better than this description. Best friends Zach and Randy and Kayla discover that their neighbors are being killed and replaced by perfect copies of their victims. This sounds familiar to me. Their only chance to survive is to covertly record the invasion and a desperate attempt to warn the world. It it sounds like an entire ripoff, but I and you never can good. tell by a trailer. But the tra- what'd you say? Oh, just the reviews I looked it up. And they're like, this is actually pretty good. Surprisingly, so uh, yeah, the, the trailer though, looked good. Yeah, even though it's body snatches. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. We're we're due for another body snatcher film now. Um, there's only been 12 in my lifetime yeah yeah it's it's time uh the one that i think may might be the best is called there inside um t-h-e-r apostrophe r-e there inside when two sisters go to an isolated cabin in the woods i've never heard that trope before but this will be interesting (laughs) to film a passion project family secrets start to get in the way as do masked strangers filming a pat passion project of their own and this is a pretty freaky trailer 
So I think this is the one I'm going to start with since none of you have seen any of these. I haven't seen one of them, but that sounds good. You can't give me yeah, any advice. Yeah, that's the one I'd probably watch first. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, all right. I, I said I'd talk about the book. This is really great. A Cosmology of Monsters um, by Sean Hamill. S-H-A-U-N. Hamill is spelled just like Mark Hamill. Um, <laughs> this, uh, uh, I think it's Random House, um, sent it to me the other day to read. It doesn't come out till uh, September 17th. But I'm halfway through it, and I really, really love it. It is, it is Lovecraftian. Um, actually, Stephen King's read it too, and he loved it. <laughs> and this is a first novel uh, from this guy. And actually, I'm going to have him on the program on December one. So, um, uh, you know, so maybe pre-order this if it sounds interesting to you. So it's mm. going to be on Audible and Kindle and, and print, obviously. Um, this one I've not delved into yet, but Journal Stone sent it to me. Uh, Doorways to the Dead Eye by Eric J. I'm, I'm not going to pronounce his name correctly. Gugnard? G-U-I-G-N-A-R-D. Yeah, uh, sorry, Eric, if you're watching this. We're Facebook friends. But it, it looks really interesting. It's about... Uh, Let's see. Luke Thacker is a drifting hobo in Depression Era, Depression Era America, riding the rails of the nation and surviving by crumbs and hope. Along the way, he learns the iconography of transients, the hobo code, better than anyone else, and deciphers a secret that thrusts him into anathasia, the middle ground of memories. I won't read the whole thing here, but it 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 looks to me you know, without having read it yet, that it's, you know, this, this hobo guy and there's a lot of supernatural in here. It just, I don't know, it just really appealed to me. It looked very, very interesting. I, uh, doorways to the dead eye. Dead eye is one word. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought so. Um, so, um, all right. In the ongoing battle uh, between those who put the milk in the bowl <laughs> and then put the cereal in. Um, I refuse to believe anyone does that. It doesn't work that way. There it, are people who do it that way. There, no. There's at least one person who does it that way, and I've, I've been shamed by my entire following for this, I think. Anyway, I got this in the mail the other day, and for those who are listening later, it is a bowl, but it's got a deep part for milk, and then up here is where you put the cereal. And so you slide your cereal down through this little opening here into the milk so that it stays... <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, Pete, I know. <laughs> so that it stays crunchy. <laughs> I weep for the future of humanity. <laughs> That has got to be the most extra cereal bowl I've ever seen. This is life. important, people. We need to be talking about things like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I like my... when the cereal gets soggy. Sounds sounds like something somebody got funding for on Shark Tank. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it Dragon does, Tank. doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm thinking, you know, it came from Amazon, so there's no name on it. I'm thinking, okay, what smartass sent this to me? Uh, you know. <laughs> that should be a horror movie, Mike. It came. <laughs> from amazon <laughs> doesn't it just sound like one of those movies you guys were talking about yeah Absolutely. that's right there's actually okay you guys should look this up when you get time there's a uh, really really funny video on youtube just go to youtube and type in i don't know milk before cereal or something like that it's hilarious uh anyway so I th i'm thinking who sent this to me who sent this to me finally i figured it out it was my sister yeah so um guys do you have anything to talk about i've got a couple more things before we go i'm gonna tell you guys how i'm gonna terrify the children of my neighborhood if you're interested but you can do your yeah. stuff first please <laughs> do all right so 
I was lucky enough to move my best friends into the house next to mine this past February. It was this huge, mm-hmm. impossible, horrible thing. And they were it was for sale by owner, and it was just an utter nightmare, but we did it. So, when we move them into this house, it looks almost exactly like mine inside. It's covered with mirrors on the inside. It's a bad Mirror. sign. Everywhere. Mirrors covering the edge of the bathtub and the shower. Mirrors on the doors. Mirrors on the walls. Mirrors on the staircase. Mm-mm. Which, you know, yeah, my friends are not into that. So they pried all these damn mirrors off and saved them because it's really hard to get rid of mirrors. But they figured out that since my house is next to their house and, you know, we love each other, we're best friends and stuff, we can connect them with a hallway of mirrors. So we have this corridor that these children can go into. And outside my place of business, for some reason, somebody left an eight foot painting of the original Tim Curry Pennywise on a board. <laughs> for some and I was reason. Like, <laughs> and then just grabbed it and put it in my minivan because why else have a mama minivan if you can't steal Pennywise paint? I mean, that's true. Right. So that's going to be like at the very end. <laughs> <laughs> like we're gonna position it. That's so, amazing. Someone, yeah. someone's gonna be calling one eight hundred four child. Well, something. we're basically gonna have like the two ones. One of them is gonna be less terrifying, and then one of them is gonna be depending on one. So it's like if you have heart conditions or you're under this age, go into this one. You must be this <laughs> tall to. Yeah, basically. Mm-hmm. Sounds well, important. It sounds, it sounds cool. like it. It sounds like an episode that. Uh, a short story that Robert Block later adopted into an episode for the thriller, A Hungry House. Nice. Mm. Which was about a haunted house with mirrors. Yeah, we never found out why. Like, we have no idea what the story is behind the house being completely festooned with mirrors. We still don't know. It's a porn thing. Oh, no. What, what no Robert, I hope not. I remember what my neighbors were playing. Maybe it's that. Watch Robert Block's. Uh, watch, watch the episode of Thriller and you'll find out what the house is, what the mirrors were really at. I don't know. You give me nightmares forever, man. Uh, for those who aren't aware, I wasn't until recently. There's a series called John Carpenter's Tales for a Halloween Night. And I believe they're up to. Um, Volume 5. Uh, I, I don't think they're on Kindle, but if that interests you, you might want to you might want to check it out. So I just thought I'd pass that on. Kelly Young, who's not here today because he thinks going out of town for Labor Day and having a good time is more important. <laughs> um, Kelly Young says that he watched a movie, uh, it's a foreign movie with subtitles, but he watched a movie on Netflix called Eerie, E-E. Ooh. R-I-E, and uh, he said it was really, really good. So I'm, I'm thinking I may watch that tonight. Well, um, I haven't heard of that at all. Stephen Graham Jones, he, I believe it was, I believe it was Stephen, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I just saved it, I keep forgetting to mention it, um, wrote on Twitter that he saw a movie called The Perfection and <laughs> really, really loved it. Yeah, I've seen that one. Have you seen it? Is now my question is: It looked like body horror to me. I can't reveal some... anything. Okay. It's one of those movies where it just keeps turning and twisting, um, and to tell you anything about it would be uh, to to ruin the purpose of it existing. I think. Well, you know, I, I guess it comes down to if Steven says to watch it, you should probably watch it. There is some body horror in there for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um. All right, now if I can just bring it down a bit. Oh, I can bring it down. You can bring it down. You're, you're about down. you're about to die on a hurricane. Well, <laughs> yeah, but no, I so I wanted to just briefly talk about one of my favorite things that happened at Necronomicon. Oh my God! Mm-hmm. Yes, we we have to recap Necronomicon. Please do. Um. So, first of all, I missed. We we I, I got caught in a. a, a traffic disaster and we missed our flight we had to fly into boston and then take a train to providence we thought we had it bad but nick gucker was delayed like 24 hours that sucks yeah that's nice um, i know that guy he's a great guy right so i'm standing in in the guy on the planet really in the i'm standing in the risd auditorium 
getting ready to watch Matango, Attack of the Mushroom People. And if you haven't seen this film, you should, because it is a acid trip. You should be, you should indulge right. on something to watch it. It's actually an adaptation of William Hope Hodgson's The Voice of the Night. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm standing there getting ready to sit down and somebody's arms come come around me and I get the biggest hug ever and it is Matt Gucker. Nick Gucker, I'm sorry, Nick Gucker. And I'm just absolutely thrilled for that for him to be there cuz I didn't think he was going to make it. Um any other highlights you want to talk about? I, I packed. I, I think I put a hundred people into the basement of a bar for for Lovecraftian trivia. It was <laughs> awesome. I had a great time. Um, people were pissed. You know, about halfway through, people were like, "Nobody can answer these questions," and I'm like, "One person has gotten them all right." And they're like, "What? No, he's cheating." It's like, "No, he's not." Because <laughs> he's won this game three years in a row, well, <laughs> three cons in a row. I I, I just have to jump in. in. I just have to jump in and say that this is the first one I've missed since I started Lovecraft Easy in 2011, and although I couldn't make it for obvious reasons, I really missed being there. So, could you name the winner again? Justin Wilson, the scholar from London College. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I have erudite literature on the history of occultism in Europe. Could you give us a sample question, Pete? Sure, <laughs> I could. Um, if I could remember, any. no, um, he could, but he won't. So, uh, this 1975 J.G. Ballard novel mm. is about a monster frozen in time that is awakened from the bottom of the ocean. And then proceeds to control the populace telepathically to try and escape Earth. Hmm. And that is the Atlantic Abomination. Wasn't no, that no, by no, no, no. wasn't that wasn't that by John Brunner? I'm sorry, John Brunner. I'm sorry, yes, John Brunner. <laughs> you threw me off. If you said John right. Brunner, I would have gotten it right. I said I yeah, I was, I, yes. So then the <laughs> next question is this nineteen seventy six novel is about a monster from the bottom of the ocean that is awakened and then proceeds to control the population telepathically so it can escape Earth by Larry Niven. That is World of Tavs. Mm -hmm. But they're all, but basically they are also, if you go back, it's the horror in the museum. This creature frozen in time that awakens the feed and escape. They're very uh, Lovecraftian novels. Um, uh, all right, another question. Um, what was the ship that the characters in Michael Chabon's Cavalier and Clay come to America on? You you would be so you would be so screwed if Rick was in the. No, I would. I, I, I haven't read that. But I know it's something like the Ark. Of yeah, the but you 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 know everything yeah. else though. Uh, your clue is a white star line. So all, the white star line, all the ships were named the Titanic. I say the Miskatonic. The Miskatonic. All of the white star line ship ended with IC. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I knew it was either the Arkham or the Miskatonic. The clue would have told me Miskatonic. It was the Miskatonic. So you know, those were, those were some of the questions. I had a whole series of questions on music. Um, including that a a a, a, a song a a a, a, a piece uh, called I think it was called a Cthulhu premiered on in 2010 and the MTV Music Awards and I asked who it was by and uh, somebody actually actually a bunch of people got it it was Dead that was a metal band wasn't it Dead Mouse okay you know so. Pete I actually had this thought before and forgot about it till now but. You know, maybe it would be kind of fun. It's up to the audience, really, but it would be kind of fun to do a Sunday show one time where you're doing the trivia thing and people can respond as they do in the text. The problem is that um, it's really, really easy to cheat at trivia now. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, googling. Yeah, that's now, uh, Why don't you? Do, why don't we have them do the trivia? A one show where we have almost everybody. 
because he, even I mean there were a lot of he asked a lot of questions which I don't know off the top of my head. The clues sometimes gives it to me. It's, it's stuff you know because like so. You, in other words, you're saying the panelists would be playing, not the audience. The, pa the pa panelists would be playing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can do that sometime. Yeah, we can limit it to like twenty seconds. That's that's. <laughs> I will, I will get none of them right, so just... Mike can determine who wins. Yeah, I'm buddy. Yeah. I'll, okay, I'll, um, I'll smile and look, look wise and intelligent. So I finally got to see the Dunwich Horror Picture Show. Oh, that was a blast. Ooh, never even heard of that. They run the Dunwich Horror Picture Show, but they remove the soundtrack, and they have a live band playing. <laughs> That's pretty oh, good. Well, when I saw it, they actually they played the soundtrack... And they had actors on the stage also talking and dancing right. around. So this time so around, Rocky Horror just uh, yeah. yeah. So so you're allowed to yell stuff out and everything, but this time around they removed the soundtrack. By the way, they had the worst copy of the Dunwich Horror ever. It's sepia tone at this point. This is this is the Sandra D version. The Sandra D version, oh. yes. <laughs> ah yes. Well, Wilbur Waitley is lovely and pretty and has no tentacles whatsoever. And correct. <laughs> Lots of tattoos, though. But anyway, um, so no. they removed. Soft love. Yes. No. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> so they've got a live orchestra playing the music, not orchestra, but a band playing the music, and then all the people that are in the band Big Nazo <clears throat> come out at critical times. Hmm. And if you don't, if you know Big Nazo. They're wearing Lovecraftian monster costumes. Oh, those guys. Oh, those yes. guys, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah. So they come out and they dance and they run amongst the audience and, you know. They, they must, they, they've, they've played this like two or three times in different shows. When I saw it, it was a different experience, but it was still fun. Well, I think that is what the point is. I think every time they're trying to do this, they're trying to change it so that you keep coming back. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what my highlight was you know apart from seeing all the people um this was something very new for me my son does live action role playing with vampire the masquerade he does this in lieu of studying or preparing <laughs> for life right. um, anyway they did uh a larp based on the king in yellow and that's why mr trivia game because it ran on saturday night and uh, basically, everyone went in, like, 1920s costume. They'd sent me a dossier on my character, and there were props I was given. Like, uh, everyone tried to dress in sort of period clothing, and they, we had hats and fake guns. And <coughs> I got a file with some information and photographs from an Indian ritual. And you went around. There were, like, 20 people. You, you, you just talk in character to people trying to figure out what's going on what the main story is about the manifestation of the king in yellow because this was an after show party for a one time only performance of the king in yellow and oh. so the actors were there the producer was there a lawyer for the estate there were cops there were gangsters um and everybody really got into it and and things that they did that were so cool were for example they had a radio playing as like background music and it was playing authentic 1920s jazz and authentic commercials from the period. But what you didn't notice is over the course of the four hours, the music got weirder and weirder, stranger and stranger. And the announcements on the radio got weirder and weirder. And you just didn't sort of notice this at first. But like I said, um, our elimination chamber has been open a great fanfare here in Boston. And uh, they had a, a projected picture on the wall as like the front window, which showed the Boston skyline. And they didn't say anything, but it gradually changed over the course of the show, or a course of the game, like um, skyscrapers would drop out. Then the moon would change position. Then there were two moons. Hmm. Then there were no buildings. Then there were weird plants. It sounds they like awesome. they did a really good job of making it unsettling. They did, and uh, the other thing is everybody really tried to get into it, you know, and that was quite a lot of fun. I, I, I would love to hear that mu music, the way that it got 
stranger and eerier and eerier. And then, of course, they have it chimes midnight, and the king in yellow enters the bar, and the costume was superb. Uh, it was just a really cool experience. I can't say that I'm going to be a LARP kind of guy. It's almost like a bridge too far for me. <laughs> oh, you but, come on. Embrace it. But no, this was, <laughs> hey, I had a blast. My son really wanted to do it. One of uh, a guy who's a, I've been friends with him for 35 years. We convinced him to jump sign up. It, uh, it was really, really cool. I, I don't suppose this was videotaped. Oh, no, because we were all trying to stay in character and so yeah. no one was take, no one took out their phones or anything. We just had like yeah, uh, no. I meant by the by someone else. Yeah. Uh, no, they because they had three people who were like I guess moderators or game masters, and they were also like waiters or bartenders or characters. They were staying in character too. Right. Uh, trying like if there was action, they'd try to adjudicate it. You know. Um, Never seen anything like that before. It was very new. Another thing I heard they had, but I didn't hear about, and I don't know if they had it or someone just wants it, was there may have been an, uh, an escape room, a Lovecraft escape room, That's where cool. you go in and there's clues and you have to try and figure out how to get out of the room. But I, so, There I was a Lovecraft escape room. I missed that. And it was over by uh, Cellar Stories. Did you do it, Pete? Um, I did not. However, I walked past it on Monday morning after the sh show. And people and were we, still trapped in there. There were fingernails, no, like strips in the door where they had, like, clawed. And worse. The, the escape room was gone, and the construction crew was tearing the building down from the inside. Wow. Uh. So it was literally, like, the last gasp for this building. Escape rooms can be fun. I've done a couple of them with Danielle and Logan for like Logan's birthday. But if they're not set up right, then they can be very frustrating. You know, and you want your money back. So, mm, yeah. uh, <laughs> do you guys, is there anything else that you want to recap? And we can do more next week on Necronomicon. And then I've yeah. got, got just two last quick things. Yeah, the last thing I want to say is that uh, Matt and Ethan let me join them for dinner one night, yeah. and they took me to this fabulous little Asian yeah. fusion place that I would love to go back to again. Mm. It was Sora, 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 and it was a little off the beaten path, but only by a block, so, and there was no reason why we couldn't go there more because it actually was one of the most cost-effective places I eat all weekend. Sounds delightful. Yeah. That sounds great. So yeah. hungry now. <laughs> yeah. I know. My mouth like instantly filled up with drool when he was uh -huh. like, Asian fusion. I was like, Arr. absolutely. Uh, I just want to say I forgot to mention when I was talking about books, uh, newly out sometime in the last month or two, I think, is Song for the Unraveling of the World by Brian Evanson. Um, oh. Collection, I believe. I and, just finished uh, uh, Collapse of Horses like last week, so that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. So so check that out. Um, and then the last thing, and, and maybe maybe I shouldn't bring it up because it, it's really worth talking about. But I I sent this to uh, I think Pete and Rick and Matt. I'm not sure if I sent it to you, Matt. About uh, Jeff Rice, the creator of the Night Stalker. You never send me anything, Mike. Oh, okay. Well, I, maybe I just sent it to the important people. I don't know. Uh, I sent it to you guys, right? Pete and Rick? Yeah, I'm not sure what you're talking about yet. He sent us an email with a link to an article on Jeff Rice. Is that the Game of Lucifer? No, it's the title is The Night Stalker Blues, and oh, you can, yes. you can Google that. And it basically, the whole article talks about how Jeff Rice was really... It's a really sad story about how he created Kolchak the Night Stalker and he was really, really screwed out of it. And I thought Rick might have some things to say about it, at least, if not Pete. Well, I sent you a link because I think the reason he got treated so on, you know, it was based, you always see Night Stalker based on an unpublished novel by Jeff Rice, and then it was published after Night Stalker was released on television. 
Why was he the poet beforehand? It sounds like a great plot. Well, it's very similar to a best-selling novel that came out before called Progeny of the Progeny of the Adder by Les Whitten, which was basically a modern vampire in Washington, D.C., has the police in all sorts of shootouts with the vampire, has blood banks being robbed, has a lot of stuff that was in The Night Stalker. So the reason why Jeff Rice never got that novel published was that they, what was was going to publish it was afraid to be hit with a plagiarism suit. Ah. Well. That, that's my guess. Sort of reminded me of, of Bill Finger, you know, with Batman. And it, it's just a really sad story. Uh, uh, next to the last paragraph. Uh, <coughs> at some point, Rice retired as typewriter, became a CPA, moved CPA and moved into a modest home located at Desert End Road in Las Vegas after Rice... Rice's death at age 71, this was in 2015, actually, a 78-year-old woman named Bobby Carson told the Las Vegas Review Journal that Rice was a man consumed by depression who frequently found himself penniless and adrift. I don't know, it's just, it's just a sad story. I wanted, I wanted to bring everybody down and, and uh, depress everyone. <laughs> An interesting thing about the copyrights on uh, the Night Stalker. Mm-hmm. Jeff, it's licensed by Jeff Rice, and he's got the rights to everything from the first, from the TV movie, since that was based on his novel. And that's really about it. You can't take anything from, I, I'm, uh, The Night Strangler may be somewhere in between. But technically, if you're doing a code character pastiche, you cannot directly reference the TV series. Really? Because hmm. I wrote a Kolchak pastiche for a, was Kolchak Passages of the Macabre was the collection, which Moonlight, uh, Moonstone, rather, publications put out. And I wanted to write a sequel to a Kolchak episode, and I had to disguise it as a sequel for, 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 for these crazy copyright reasons. Hmm. Well, I'll say everybody else who contributed to the story didn't didn't seem to worry about disguising things. So there were characters <laughs> on the TV show popping up, you know, like, like the cab driver from the youth killer and whatever. So well, I, just, uh, I felt, why did I bother? <laughs> yeah. The, the, the real reason why I brought this up is because I think just about everybody here on the panel is a big fan of Kolchak. Mm. Um, and that that was the first reason the second reason is you know we're all creative types uh it's like you trevor i saw a, please do not repost my art without uh <laughs> you know crediting yeah. me at the very least you know that type of thing the last paragraph is says uh, the sad life and either and even sadder death of jeff rice is a reminder to creative workers that there will always be sharks out there ready and willing to exploit your talent rice mm -hmm. should have died a wealthy man uh, a cynical Hollywood and underhanded business practices denied him his hard-earned wealth. Um, so yeah, you, if you're you're writer, um, artist, be careful. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. and read those goddamn um, uh, <laughs> anything you sign. Read it. You know, small yeah. print. Yeah, small print. Read, read yeah. the small print. Well, There's be careful who you sell your rights to. Absolutely. Mm. Or find out who you're selling your rights to. I mean, I think when Robert Block sold Psycho, we didn't know it was his job. Uh, I yeah. will not name names, but there is a publisher out there that a lot of people use who uh, is my understanding that they give away their rights in the future to TV and, or, it, you know, if it's ever made into a TV series or a movie. So, and that's mm. not the way it's supposed to be. No. So... <laughs> So anyway, uh, yeah, uh, Trevor, mm -hmm. thanks so much for being on the show. Absolutely, really appreciate thank, it. Thank you I, so much for having me. Yeah, I, I really, really love your art. Like I said a few minutes ago, it it just reminds me of you, you're the art version of Knife Point Horror and um, high praise. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh yes, Matt Prize. 
Just a reminder, the prize is mongrels. Send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com. Put mongrels in the subject heading and you'll be entered in the drawing. Sometime, maybe by Sunday next week, I'll do the drawing and uh, someone will win. Has, since you've been doing this for me, has anyone put anything in the body of the emails? Like, Mike is awesome or <laughs> anything anything of that nature? Um, Pete's, Pete's awesome. <laughs> Kelly's uh, drunk. <laughs> mostly nothing. Just pick me, pick me. Give me my yeah, it's like the it's like the seagulls in Finding Nemo. Mine, 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 mine. mine, mine, mine. <laughs> Actually, they say how much they love the show. Um, no. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. So, everyone, <laughs> thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, please remember about my Patreon. Just Google Lovecraft Easing Patreon. I really appreciate the support, uh, Trevor. <laughs> man, I'll keep following you on Twitter and and, and watching everything that you create. So, Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, your Twitter is uh, twitter.com slash. Uh, that was slimy swamp ghost. Slimy oh. swamp ghost, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, my my Instagram is Trevor Henderson though. All one word. Okay, and yeah. your Twitter is slimy swamp ghost. Yep, that's so. it. All right. Well, thanks for being on the show. Hey guys, thanks for being here too, especially you, Pete, since you're. Hey, this is, I'm trying party. to maintain normality, <laughs> just to, to to remain calm, because shit's gonna happen. I feel sorry for you that being on this show is normal for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank All right, you thanks. for letting me meet Trevor without even having to put my children in a box. <laughs> yeah, nice meeting you in person, or not person, but like seeing your face. Pretty now. close. What yeah, passes yeah. these days? Yeah, I yeah. guess so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Trevor, you're a very nice guy, and you're a very talented guy. Thank you for being on the show. Same to you. Thank you. Thanks. And, um, nice thanks to meet you, guys. If you and find those books, let us know. Yeah, yes. I, will, I will. Yeah, for I'll, real, dude. Oh my I'll God. I'll reach out on. I'll reach out on Twitter. I'll, I'll look for them tomorrow. Sell them. Damn it. Yeah. Sell them. I'm serious. Yeah, you <laughs> should totally show people them again and like if make I have them, them aware again. If I have them, I will for sure. Yeah. All right. What what, what books are these? I missed. The, I was off. Oh. It's a, a Lovecraft art scene I made uh, many years ago called Puffed Chagas. Okay. Different artists contributing uh, black and white drawings um, of their Lovecraft story of choice. And I, uh, I dissuaded people from drawing Cthulhu uh, just because it's so prevalent. So it's, it's more obscure. Yeah. Yeah, there's like a really great color on space illustration by Michael DeForge and just all kinds oh, yeah. of cool stuff. In the, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's always great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, everybody. My, my dog is yelling at me to take her out. And especially, uh, all kidding aside, Pete, you're in our thoughts. Please, please stay safe. So, uh, no, I'm going to go get drunk and run around outside in 100 mile an hour. Wind. Well, don't oh. run with scissors. Have at least. fun. Yeah. yeah. No right. running with scissors and you'll be okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. And we'll, we'll see you next week. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.